제3회 서울국제명상엑스포 2022 명상 새로운 세계 어, 이 컨퍼런스에 오신 것을 진심으로 환영합니다. 잠시 후 10시부터 학술 컨퍼런스가 시작됩니다. 어, 참석해 주신 내 외빈 여러분들께서는 행사장 안으로 입장해 주시기 바랍니다. 입장하신 내 분들은 앞좌석부터 착석해 주시길 부탁드립니다. 원활한 진행을 위해 소지하고 계신 휴대폰은 진동 모드로 전환하여 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 아울러 코로나 예방을 위해 모든 순서가 진행되는 동안 마스크 착용을 부탁드립니다. 본 행사는 방역 지침을 준수하고 있습니다. 
출산 알겠습니다. 안녕하십니까 제3회 서울 국제 명상 엑스포 2022 명상 새로운 세계 We are now starting the day two of the academic conference for the third Seoul International Meditation Expo. I'm Venerable Boyle, the uh, president of the Sangha Seminary in Hainza Temple. I will be your host today. Today's conference is organized by Dongguk University and sponsored by Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism to lead the globalization of meditation and bring it to the wider public. The three the three-day event will be held in Dongguk University campus, both on and offline, and offer 14 programs, including this conference. You can go check them 3D in Metaverse or in our home page. Now, we have many people joining us in person as well as uh, online. So the theme of the day two of the conference is meditation and science. We have experts and scholars in medicine, neuroscience, oriental medicine, and astrophysics who will share in-depth knowledge with the audience who meditate, who, uh, who meditation can be understood and reconstructed on the scientific basis. After the presentation, we'll have Q&A session. We've been collecting questions since May 11, but you may ask questions real time. Uh, we are also providing simultaneous translation in Korean and English. Please uh, click globe icon on the bottom and choose the language channels if you like to use translation.
Now, the first speaker today is Professor Inakaza from Harvard Medical School. She's researching ways to combine biofeedback, which is a process of training your body to control and regulate involuntary movements, such as heartbeat, with mindful meditation to help problems such as stress and sleep difficulties. The title of her presentation is Heart Rate Bioability, Mindfulness, and Compassion. Uh, looking forward to spending the next hour uh, with you. I'm going to share my slides. Okay. And we are going to talk about heart rate variability, mindfulness, and compassion. I'd like to start with becoming aware of what's, what connects those three concepts together. And that is self-regulation. Mindfulness, self-compassion, and heart rate variability are all at the core of our ability to self-regulate. That is our ability to respond to changes in our environment in healthy and helpful ways. And all three can be used uh, interchangeably or simultaneously in order to help improve our ability to be healthy, to respond well to uh, stress and challenges to whatever might come our way. You've already heard several experts define the concepts of mindfulness and compassion, so I will not do that here, but I will talk about the concept of heart rate variability and then connect those with mindfulness and self-compassion. Heart rate variability refers to the change in time that passes from one heartbeat to the next. What you see on the screen in front of you is an electrocardiogram. Each R peak indicated as R1, R2, R3 is a reflection of a heartbeat. It's the contraction of the left ventricle of the heart contracting and sending oxygenated blood out to the body. So if you were to take your pulse on your wrist or on your neck, you would feel a thump, thump, thump. Each one of those thumps is a heartbeat. It's that contraction of the left ventricle of the heart sending blood out to the body that you see as R1, R2, R3 peaks on the slide. And if you were to count those thumps, you would probably count somewhere between 60 and 80 of them in a minute. That is your heart rate. But the time that passes from one heartbeat to the next is changing all the time. That is what we refer to as heart rate variability. Sometimes heartbeats come closer together and the heart rate is speeding up as you see in intervals R4 to R5 and R5 to R6. And other times, heartbeats start coming further apart. The time from one heartbeat to the next becomes longer. The heart rate is slowing down, as you can see in intervals R1 to R2, R2 to R3, R3 to R4. Your heart rate is speeding up and slowing down at all times. If your heart were to beat with 882 millisecond intervals, your heart rate would be 68 beats per minute. If your heart were to beat with 674 millisecond intervals, your heart rate would be 89 beats per minute. That is your instantaneous heart rate. And that is the heart rate that is changing all the time, increasing and decreasing, accelerating and decelerating. Here we see another way of looking at your heart rate variability. On the top of the slide, you see the raw EKG with those R peaks clearly visible. This is a heartbeat, 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 heartbeat. And on the bottom 
is a display of that instantaneous heart rate, showing us how the heart rate is changing all the time. So if your heart were to beat with this interval at all times, this would be your heart rate. If your heart were to beat with this interval at all times, this would be your heart rate. So as the intervals coming are coming a little bit further apart right here, you can see that those intervals are just a little bit longer than, for example, the intervals here. The heart rate is slowing down with these longer intervals and the heart rate is speeding up with these shorter intervals. Your heart rate is doing that all the time, increasing and decreasing, increasing and decreasing. That is heart rate variability. Your average heart rate might remain the same, but heart rate variability may be higher or lower. For example, on these two images, this is heart rate variability of a person, of, of two people, both of them, average heart rate is around 70 beats per minute. The graph on the left, heart rate variability is quite a bit higher. The heart rate varies from about 90 to a high of about 90 to a low of about 70 beats per minute for each breath cycle for a max min heart rate variability of 20 beats per minute. On the image on the right, heart rate variability varies only from about 65 to 70 beats per minute for each breath cycle for a max min heart rate variability of about five. So with the same average heart rate, heart rate variability may be quite a bit higher or lower. The higher someone's heart rate variability, the better off they generally are, the better they're able to respond to stress and challenges in healthy and helpful ways. In our nervous system, heart rate variability reflects the ability of our autonomic nervous system to regulate itself. It tells us how well are we able to reach our peak uh, performance, how well we're able to achieve optimal amount of activation. So on this graph, you see the relationship between the, our physiological activation and performance, something called the yorkis dotson curve. When our physiological activation is low, when we're quite relaxed, we don't actually perform very well. Right? You know, even though uh, there is a common misconception that we need to be relaxed in order to perform at our best, that is actually not so. If we are very relaxed, we might have trouble paying attention. We might have trouble responding quickly to uh, you know, whatever might be happening in our environment. We may not be able, may not be able to activate very well. And we need to find that optimal sweet spot of moderate activation in order to be at our best, in order to perform at our best. If we get overactivated, if we drop on the other side of that inverted U, we don't perform so well either. So this curve demonstrates just how important it is for us to find that sweet spot of activation in order for us to be at our best. And heart rate variability indicates just how well are we able to find that sweet spot of activation in order to be at our best, no matter what the situation is, no matter what the challenge is, and how well we're able to recover once the challenge is over. It is our parasympathetic nervous system that helps us achieve this optimal level of activation. The sympathetic nervous system does not really have a built-in shutoff mechanism. It increases its activation and we need the parasympathetic nervous system to come on and put on the brakes to sympathetic activation in order to allow us to settle at that optimal level of activation, whatever is needed for the challenge in front of us. And as we'll see, um, it is the parasympathetic nervous system that is responsible for heart rate variability being high and it's what's responsible for us uh, being able to find that optimal level of activation. Quite a bit of research um, in the last you know, four or five decades has shown just how important um, heart rate variability is for our health and well-being. For example, 
the Framingham Heart Study, which is uh, perhaps the longest running uh, heart study in the world, um, has shown that heart rate variability uh, is a better predictor of long-term cardiovascular health than blood pressure, cholesterol levels, and resting heart rate. So high heart rate variability is predictive of better cardiovascular health, whereas low heart rate variability is predictive of uh, potential for high blood pressure or uh, unpleasant cardiovascular events happening uh, 10 years down the road from these measurements. Even when the person was entirely healthy at the time the measurements are taken. Heart variability is related to our ability to be resilient. Uh, it is related to our ability to respond to stress. It's related to our ability to perform at our best. And it is related to our psychophysiological health. Let me expand on that last one. There is a number of psychophysiological conditions where we know that heart rate variability is low and increasing heart rate variability through biofeedback helps improve the symptoms of these conditions. Conditions like anxiety, chronic pain, depression, diabetes, high blood pressure, irritable bowel syndrome, post-traumatic stress disorder, preeclampsia, traumatic brain injury, migraine are among those conditions where we know suffer those suffering from these conditions have low heart variability. And if we help them improve their heart rate variability, their symptoms improve as well. There's a number of influences on heart rate variability, some that are under our control and some less so. We can increase heart rate variability through exercise, a healthier lifestyle, including paying attention to our sleep and nutrition, biofeedback, and mindfulness and self-compassion. And then heart rate variability is decreased by age, poor sleep, chronic stress, and chronic illness. It's important to think about how we measure um, heart rate variability. Uh, if you read any research that involves heart rate variability, uh, you might see references to a number of different ways in which heart rate variability is measured. Um, and that's why I'm, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about measuring HRV because there are so many different ways of measuring it. It's important to understand which, uh, what each of these uh, uh, measurements might mean. So if, if you're reading about it, uh, you'll understand what the, um, uh, the author is referring to. There are two main ways to measure um, heart rate variability. Time domain measures is one. Uh, and that just means we're, we're graphing heart rate over time. And then there are several different ways that we can measure heart rate variability within that. I will talk about the three uh, main ones. There are actually several others um, that, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to review right now, but you should know that these are not the only time domain measures. Maxmin HRV refers to the change in heart rate within each breath cycle. So the way in the highest heart rate and the lowest heart rate within each cycle. Highest heart rate minus the lowest heart rate is your maximum um, HRV. So on this uh, uh, top graph uh, looks like uh, maximum HRV is about 30 as the highest is 90 beats per minute. The lowest is about 60 for each breath cycle. So this is maximum HRV of about 30, which is quite high. Uh, this is a uh, heart rate ability of a very healthy athlete. Now we have as DNN, referring to the standard deviation of normal to normal interval. Normal to normal interval refers to the time that passes from one heartbeat to the next. It's uh, um, also called RR interval, same thing. Uh, for our purposes, it's, uh, it's the same thing. There, there is a uh, slight nuance there, but uh, as far as understanding uh, this measurement, normal to normal interval and RR interval uh, can be referred to as the same. So with standard deviation of the normal to normal interval, we're taking these uh, uh, time intervals in milliseconds and calculating the standard deviation, telling us uh, how far apart uh, are all these time intervals spread uh, from that middle point. 
And then the um, RMSSD, the root mean square of successive different differences, um, is another way to uh, measure the spread, uh, the way in which um, the heart rate intervals are different uh, from each other, and particularly from intervals next, um, you know, from adjacent intervals. Another way to measure heart rate variability is through spectral analysis. And this one is a little bit less intuitive. Here, we are taking the heart rate signal, which is composed of a number of different waves of different frequencies and decomposing that signal into component frequencies that we know where they come from and we can interpret them in some way. The software uses an algorithm called the fast Fourier transform to decompose your heart rate wave into component frequencies. An easy way to think about it uh, is to think about white light, uh, which is composed of the seven different color frequencies mixed in together. Right? You know, white light is composed of the uh, the green and the uh, blue and the purple and the red. Right? You know, all those uh, uh, color frequencies mixed in together. And if we take a prism and look at white light through that prism, we'll see the seven different colors of the rainbow, because the prism will decompose white light into those component frequencies. The software we use for heart rate variability analysis does the same thing to the heart rate signal. It decomposes that signal that is made up of uh, you know, all these different frequencies uh, mixed in together into component frequencies. And there are three frequency ranges um, that we can talk about here because you know, we know what the input into these frequencies is. Uh, we know where the signal comes from and therefore can tell, uh, can, can, we can interpret the signal uh, in a way um, that tells us something about our autonomic nervous system functioning. So the high frequency signal, which on this uh, graph at the bottom is represented uh, in white, right? So this means that the uh, signal is uh, coming quite fast, right? The oscillations of the signal are coming quite, uh, quite fast. Uh, the high frequency signal, the input for it is from the parasympathetic nervous system uh, or the vagal nerve. The very low frequency signal on this graph represented in green, right? So the signal is coming quite a bit slower. The oscillations are quite a bit slower. The input into the very low frequency signal is primarily from the sympathetic nervous system. And then the low frequency signal represented in orange on this graph, the input for this one is from the baroreflex or our blood pressure regu regulation reflex and the parasympathetic nervous system. So depending on which one of these frequencies is dominant at the time of measurement, we can tell something about the functioning of the autonomic nervous system at the time. There are two main sources of heart rate variability. You know, where, where does it come from? Why does our um, heart rate increase and decrease in this way? And there are two main sources for it. One is the baroreflex, uh, our uh, homeostatic ability to regulate our blood pressure. There are stretch receptors called the baroreceptors located in our aorta and carotid arteries that are sensitive to stretch um, as our arteries, as the blood pressure rises, that uh, uh, puts more pressure on the blood vessels. The baroreceptors detect the greater stretch, send a signal to the medulla oblongata, um, a uh, part of the brainstem that is responsible for regulating the blood pressure, which then perceives uh, that input and sends a signal to the heart to slow down and reduce the force of contraction and for the blood vessels to dilate, which then reduces our blood pressure. And as the blood pressure reduces, the stretch on the blood vessels reduces as well. The baroreceptors pick that up and send the signal back to the brain, which then sends a signal to increase the heart rate and constrict the blood vessels, increasing the blood pressure again. So our blood pressure is actually fluctuating. And 
in, in all the time as well, just not nearly as much as the heart rate. We want the heart rate to change as much as possible, but we want the blood pressure to stay fairly stable with small fluctuations. So there is a very concrete relationship between the heart rate and the blood pressure, uh, and this is one of the inputs into heart rate variability. The second source or input into heart rate variability is something called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Um, and arrhythmia in this case does not mean anything bad. Um, it just means that the heart rate and the breath change together. So as the heart rate, as, as we breathe in, is indicated by this blue wave right here, right? This is, uh, as the blue wave goes up, that's an inhalation. Uh, so as we breathe in, the heart rate increases. You can see that by the R peaks coming closer together. So it means that we, as we breathe in, the heart rate increases. And as we breathe out, the heart rate decreases as indicated by the um, heartbeats, the R waves coming further apart. So as we breathe in, heart rate goes up. As we breathe out, heart rate goes down. As we breathe in, heart rate goes up. And as we breathe out, heart rate goes down. This is the second major source of heart rate variability and the reason why our heart rate varies as much as it does. Now let's think about heart rate variability, mindfulness, and compassion. What do they all have in common? How can we use them all together? First of all, they're all responsible for self-regulation. They're responsible for our ability to respond to changes in our internal and external environment in a helpful and healthy way. The parasympathetic nervous system is a major source of heart rate variability, and it also underlies mindfulness and compassion. So the foundational source for all three of these concepts is the same, parasympathetic nervous system, including the vagal nerve. Heart rate variability can be used as a biomarker for measuring mindfulness and compassion. And furthermore, HRV training, a way to increase heart rate variability, can be used to complement mindfulness and compassion training as well. So let's talk more about this relationship between heart rate variability and mindfulness first. For example, heart rate variability and mindfulness amplify each other's effects on well being, as this one um, study, as a recent study has shown. Separately in the study, both heart rate variability and mindfulness were related to lower emotional exhaustion and greater relaxation in healthcare workers. But together, their effect was amplified. So there was an interaction effect such that the emotional exhaustion was lowest and relaxation was highest when both heart rate variability and mindfulness were high. So heart rate variability by itself makes a difference and helps people feel better. Mindfulness uh, in itself makes a difference and is related to uh, people's well-being. But when you bring the two together, uh, people do the best. Heart rate variability is also a very common marker um, for, for mindfulness. And in this particular study, heart rate variability was found to be a biomarker for treatment response for mindfulness-based interventions. In the study that was comparing mindfulness-based interventions and fluoxetine in treating generalized anxiety disorder, there was a subgroup of patients for whom the, the mindfulness-based interventions was actually less effective, and the researchers were able to identify that group of patients through measuring their pretreatment heart rate variability. Finally, heart rate variability is an objective way to show the effectiveness of these mindfulness-based interventions. Numerous studies have used HRV to quantify the effectiveness of MBIs. And one recent review study determined that heart rate variability is an objective biomarker that we can effectively use to quantify effects of mindfulness-based interventions. 
Now let's talk about heart irritability and compassion. Research shows that higher heart irritability is associated with greater connectivity between the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and areas of the brain that are also strongly connected with the experience of compassion. So areas of the brain, such as the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex, the middle cingulate cortex, and the amygdala. So there is a direct relationship in the brain between higher heart variability and the areas of the brain that are responsible for our experience of compassion. As our heart variability increases, the activity uh, in, in these, uh, the connectivity with these brain um, areas uh, is increased. There's a number of other studies showing a strong connection between heart rate variability and compassion. For example, uh, a recent meta analysis showed strong association between heart rate variability and compassion with medium effect sizes. Another study showed that increased heart rate variability is associated with higher likelihood of compassionate action. Right? That's pretty important. Not only do we want to feel compassion, but we also want to act on it. And those with higher heart rate variability are more likely to engage in compassionate action. Higher heart rate variability at baseline is associated with both state and trait compassion. So it's associated with just our baseline um, compassion as well as uh, compassion that's, that happens in certain states. Finally, we also know that compassion focused practices tend to improve heart rate variability. However, the relationship between heart rate variability and compassion is not entirely straightforward. There are some important nuances that are that we should keep in mind when thinking about HRV and compassion. For example, one study showed that self-compassion is associated with higher HRV reactivity. That means that self-compassion is associated with heart variability becoming smaller or bigger depending on what the person was engaged in. So in this, um, in this study, participants were asked uh, to write uh, in a self-critical uh, manner, right? So they were writing about something about themselves and uh, um, criticizing their qualities and uh, um, you know, mimicking the way that you know, we often judge ourselves harshly uh, when we're having a hard time. Um, so during this task, self-criticism was, was associated with lower heart rate variability at the time of writing, which makes sense because being self-critical is stressful, right? So that means that uh, those participants were actually engaging with the task. Their heart rate variability became lower as they were more stressed. And then their heart rate variability became higher when they were recovering from that task. So when they were able to let go of self-criticism, their heart rate variability increased. And what's interesting is this increase in heart rate variability only happened for those who also increased their self-compassion during the six-week self-compassion training. So this is really important. Um, you know, increase in heart rate variability only happened for those who also increased their self-compassion and who are able to engage better with the self-critical task and then recover better from it. Now, this idea of compassionate action, right? It, not only do we want to experience compassion, but it's really important to act on it as well. So we know that greater attention and sensitivity to other suffering is associated with lower heart rate variability. Why is that? Because we are attending to another person's suffering and that affects, you know, that affects our nervous system. That's stressful. That lowers our heart rate variability. And that is okay. Because then when we're able to act 
in compassionate ways, that is associated with higher heart rate variability. So if we're just attending to other people's suffering, we might be taking on some of that suffering that is stressful, that reduces our ability to self-regulate in that moment. But when we act in compassionate ways, that actually improves our ability to self-regulate. It improves our heart rate variability. Another very interesting study showed an interaction between heart rate variability and self-compassion training for pain. Uh, in this situation, this was experimentally induced pain where the participants were asked to um, hold a, um, a, a very cold glass or bottle you know, with, uh, with ice um, and they experienced you know, moderate amounts of pain. The researchers measured participants' trait, self-compassion, and resting or baseline heart rate variability. And they found that self-compassion was associated with lower pain only when heart rate variability was high. And interestingly, self-compassion was actually associated with higher pain when heart rate variability was low. So what does this mean? It might mean that people whose heart rate variability is low, meaning that they're having trouble regulating their emotional and physiological activation, actually have a hard time with self-compassion. And, it, um, and they experience higher pain when attempting to be self-compassionate because they're actually having a hard time regulating their nervous system enough to experience self-compassion. But when someone's heart rate variability is higher, they're able to regulate better. They're able to respond to their environment in a healthier way, are able to make better use of self-compassion practices. And self-compassion is associated with lower pain for them. So perhaps increasing heart rate variability might make it easier for people to make use of, of uh, things like self-compassion uh, training. And this is, is something that we need to continue looking at uh, with, uh, with re in research. So having looked at the connection between heart rate variability, mindfulness, and self-compassion, let's think about how we might integrate heart rate variability into mindfulness and self-compassion practices. First of all, heart rate variability serves as a biomarker for compassion and mindfulness. We can establish, we can, we can use heart rate variability monitoring to establish a baseline so that we know where we're starting off. You know, let's say uh, prior to um, participating in a mindfulness course or a compassion or a self-compassion course, uh, we can take uh, several days off uh, our heart rate variability readings so we know where we are, so that we can monitor our progress as we go through the mindfulness or the self-compassion course, and we can see where we end up at the end. We can use heart variability measurements to tell us how well we are learning, you know, how well is our body responding to mindfulness and self-compassion practices. We can assess and train the capacity to engage in mindfulness and compassion-based interventions. Right? You know, that study that identified a subgroup of patients who had trouble with mindfulness-based interventions we can identify folks early on who might have trouble with mindfulness or self-compassion practices. And we might initially help them raise their heart rate variability before engaging in mindfulness and self-compassion courses uh, or practices in order to actually help them make the best use of that training. Finally, heart rate variability is data. Uh, it tells us exactly what's going on with our nervous system. Um, and this data-driven approach may often increase the appeal of mindfulness and self-compassion-based interventions for perhaps the more skeptical folks, for those who say, you know, well, you know, show me, tell me whether this is actually going to work for me. Uh, and being able to use that uh, reliable uh, measurement of uh, uh, physiological functioning uh, can be a really good way to engage people who might otherwise hesitate to engage in mindfulness or compassion-based practices. We can also use 
heart rate variability biofeedback to train our heart rate variability to increase. So what is biofeedback? Biofeedback is a way for us to actually see what our heart rate variability is doing in real time, right? You know, we can, as you see on this, uh, uh, on the side of the slide, you know, we, we can see what's happening with our um, heart rate in real time. Uh, it tells us how our heart rate is changing with each breath. So we can track how our heart rate variability is changing and we can see how our breathing practices which is what we can do to increase heart rate variability actually works to increase HRV in real time. We know that heart rate variability biofeedback is effective in increasing baseline HRV over time. And we can use this to facilitate mindfulness and self-compassion training. HRV biofeedback is done through breath training. Breathing is also something we attend attend to a lot in mindfulness and self-compassion. The attention to the breath is a little bit different in HRV, but can, can very easily be done in mindful and compassionate ways. Heart rate variability training is done through something called resonance frequency breathing. Resonance is a physics concept that describes the property of an oscillating system in which two components of that oscillating system interplay with each other, producing maximum oscillations of one of them. So it's a stimulations from one part of the system produce maximum oscillations in the other. An easy way to think about it is to compare this system to pushing a child on a swing. So a person is one part of the system, the child on the swing is the other part of the system. And there are numerous, numerous ways in which you might be able to push the swing. You can push the swing once with a lot of force and it will go up, but not very evenly, will come right back down. Or you can push the swing with short, frequent bursts and the swing is gonna go up just a little bit and come right back down. And in both of these scenarios, the child is not going to be very happy. But you can find a way to push the swing in measured, regular, even ways so that each time you push, the swing goes up as much as possible and comes down as much as possible and goes up as much as possible and comes down as much as possible, maximizing the delight of the child. Your breath stimulates the heart rate in the same way as the person pushing the swing. As you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. As you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. And we can find an optimal way of breathing that will maximize the way in which your heart rate goes up on each inhalation and the way in which your heart rate goes down on each exhalation. So on the, on the right part of your slide, you see the way in which your heart rate might, cha might change as a result of resonance frequency breathing. The red signal is your heart rate at rest, going up and down a bit. But as you add heart rate variability biofeedback, as you add that resonance frequency breathing, your heart rate starts going up a lot more and coming down a lot more. And that is what we're looking for. As we breathe at our resonance frequency breathing, we increase the heart rate as much as possible on the inhalation, decrease it as much as possible on the exhalation. Um, and during that time, we train our nervous system to increase its resilience, to increase our ability to respond to stress and challenges in healthy ways. And over time, you know, that ability to respond to stress and challenges in healthy ways improves. And each time we practice resonance frequency breathing, we build that ability to respond and we train our nervous system to respond in healthy ways. You might wonder, well, how does heart variability enhance meditation? 
as we talked about, it, amplifi it amplifies the effectiveness of mindfulness and self-compassion practices. Because heart survivability training improves our physiological ability to self-regulate, it can decrease physiological arousal at the time of distress. It improves our self-regulation and therefore reduces the intensity of suffering without a struggle. So it makes it easier to accept experiences that may otherwise be fundamentally unacceptable, such as, for example, experience of panic. We can use heart regulatory training to reduce the intensity of suffering and enabling people to become mindful and compassionate during experience of severe anxiety or panic. It allows people to stop pushing away from, int from intense suffering. HRV biofeedback also increases body awareness, facilitates connections between physiological and emotional states, and provides real-time feedback on the effects of meditation. Many people wonder, um, and you know, some of you might be thinking, well, you know, how does biofeedback and um, mindfulness work together, they seem to be the complete opposites of each other. So, you know, biofeedback is all about action and mindfulness is all about allowing things to be and letting go. How can this two possibly work together? And the parable of the lute, the story of the middle way, uh, gives us a great metaphor for just how biofeedback and mindfulness work together. So the parable of the lute tells a story of Sona, um, the son uh, of a businessman in, a, uh, in ancient India who wanted to find enlightenment. So he went off and he meditated um, and he worked really hard to reach enlightenment and he couldn't get there. So he sought out the Buddha and he asked the Buddha, help me, you know, help me get there because what I'm doing is not quite working. And the Buddha knew that Sona was a skilled lute player. So he said, tell me, Sona, when, you are, when the strings of your lute are tuned very tightly, can you play it well? No, I can't. It doesn't sound very good. And if the strings of the lute are tuned very loosely, can you play it well then? No, that doesn't work very well either. It doesn't sound good. Okay, how about if the strings of the lute are tuned just right? Can you play it well then? Yes, then I can. Then it, my lute sounds beautiful. Well, there you go, Sona. Here's that middle way between goal-directed action and letting go. You need to find that balance just right, tuning the strings of the lute not too tight, not too loose. And that's exactly what biofeedback allows us to do. It's the middle way between goal-directed action, which is biofeedback, and letting go, which is mindfulness. Combining the two together helps us find the middle way, helps us find an optimal state of activation, helps us find an optimal way of responding to stress and challenges. So if you were to integrate heart rate variability, training, mindfulness, and self-compassion, you might begin your meditation practice with some HRV breathing at resonance frequency rate. You may come back to your resonance frequency breathing as an anchor when your attention wanders off during meditation practice. And you might adopt compassionate attitude during your practice. We're all human, we all make mistakes, no one's perfect. Sometimes our minds wander off, sometimes we can't quite find our optimal breathing rate, and all of that is okay, being kind to ourselves, both in the content and the tone of our self-talk. So to finish, let's try this together. We're going to use low and slow breathing that in a moment I'm going to pace you at six breaths per minute, which is the rate of breathing that gets close enough to resonance frequency breathing for most people. 
Residence frequency of breathing is typically between somewhere between four and seven breaths per minute. And each person has their own. But since we can't determine each of your residence frequencies right now, I will pace you at six breaths per minute, which will get close enough for most of you. And we'll use low and slow breathing, where I'm going to ask you to shift your breath to the belly, inhale slowly, slowing down your rate of breathing, inhaling as if you are smelling a flower, and then exhaling slowly through the nose or through pursed lips, as if you're blowing out a candle like this. And there is no need for a particularly big or deep breath, just normal. Let's do this together. Breathing in and out. In and out. And I will now pace your breathing As the purple ball goes up, you're gonna breathe in. And as the purple ball goes down, you're going to breathe out. In. Out. Continue breathing, perhaps following the pacer or just doing the best you can to continue breathing at this rate. And I will guide you through a meditation practice for a very shortened version of how you might do this to combine HRV biofeedback training and mindfulness and self-compassion. So I'm going to ask you to think about a difficult person in your life who you would very much would like to help, but who also is kind of hard, and who may be hard to help. And as you bring that person in mind, continue breathing in that low and slow measured way. Repeating silently after me. Everyone is on his or her own life journey. I am not the cause of this person's suffering. Nor is it entirely within my power to make it go away even if I wish I could. Moments like this are difficult to bear. Yet I may still try to help if I can. And taking another low and slow breath in and out. Coming back. Thank you very much. And I will now take questions. Pakistanita. <웃음> 네, 이나 카잔 교수님 좋은 발표 잘 Thank 들었습니다. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. 어, 이나 카잔 교수님께서는 심박 강 네. Professor Ina Kazan has presented us about the HRV and compassion and mindfulness. We will have about 10-minute Q&A session. 
as I mentioned before, we have collected many, many questions. So we'll, uh, we choose two questions and we'll uh, present it to the Professor Kazan. The first question is, I'm curious how HRV breathing training is related to traditional Buddhist breathing meditation in terms of methodology. HRV um, breathing training is a way that in which we mindfully, uh, where we produce mindful change uh, to our breath. And the idea is to allow the breath to follow this resonance frequency breathing rate without struggling, without controlling the breath. Uh, the idea is, you know, this is not, you know, a breath control uh, practice. Um, the idea is to uh, allow the breath to follow this gentle you know, rise and fall, you're know, following the pacer, allowing yourself to fall into the resonance frequency breathing rate, uh, mindfully observing what that breath feels like, uh, noticing what the inhalation feels like, noticing what the exhalation uh, feels like, where you feel the inhalation, where you feel the exhalation. Um, and the idea is to learn how the body response you know to that rate of breathing so that eventually uh, you don't need the pacer so that you can enter the residence frequency breathing rate uh, without having to rely on any external methods but rather letting your breath fall into that uh, breath uh, on your own mindfully um, and utilizing the same principles of mindful breathing practice that you would um, in a um, traditional uh, breath meditation. 네, 감사합니다. 어, 두 번째 질문인데요. 두 번째 second question. I think it is related to the first question. So are there any differences in HRV between meditation experts versus expert uh, meditation novice? Is there any what are the possible interpretations and patterns? People who are experienced meditators uh, will have an easier time uh, falling into their resonance frequency breathing rate uh, you know, without a struggle because they already have so much experience uh, attending to the breath without a struggle. So falling into that resonance frequency pace um, is typically easier um, for them, uh, but certainly novice meditators you know, will, you know, with a little bit of practice, will be able to uh, achieve that as well. And there is some research showing that experienced meditators um, have higher um, heart rate variability uh, than novice meditators, uh, but that research is actually not entirely consistent. Um, and, and the reason for it might have something to do with uh, uh, the rate of breathing. In traditional meditation, we don't necessarily reduce uh, the rate of breathing, right? And in order to increase heart rate variability, that reduction in the breathing rate uh, seems to be uh, quite, uh, quite important. So the research is not entirely consistent and we need to look more into uh, what, uh, what, what underlies um, the increases in HRV for some long-term meditators, but perhaps not others. Oh, is there anyone who now uh, ask a question from the audience? I'd like to take one from the audience. <laughs> Are we, are, are we taking a question from the audience or are we taking a question from the Zoom chatting? Uh, we have a question from the Zoom. Oh, oh, sorry. So is there any meditation method that I can use in I'm the sorry, everyday life setting? hear the translation. Oh, can you hear me? The wait a minute. It's the... Can you hear me? Um, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. I think you were on mute. Repeat the question. 
so the is there any meditation method I can apply okay. to the everyday life that is related to the HRV, uh, mindfulness, and compassion at the same time? Um, my suggestion uh, is to use any meditation uh, practice that you, yeah, that you enjoy, uh, but perhaps start it with doing some um, heart rate variability breathing first. Um, I do recommend uh, learning some, you know, learning to uh, breathe at your residence frequency first, uh, just in a mindful way so that you're not struggling with that breath. Um, and then bringing that uh, practice uh, into your meditation practice, oh, you know, whatever meditation you enjoy, uh, you know, let's say, you know, it might be the, uh, the meta, you know, the self-compassion practice, which is a, a wonderful um, addition to your um, everyday life. You might start it with doing five minutes of resonance frequency breathing, um, then, um, you know, while staying, you know, in that uh, breathing uh, state, uh, practicing uh, the meta, uh, you can do the same thing with a breath meditation. You know, you might allow your uh, breathing to fall into your resonance frequency breathing rate, um, stay there for five minutes and then let go of the focus on the particular rate uh, and just uh, attend to the sensations of the breath. Um, but the nice thing is you can really combine this with uh, uh, any kind of uh, meditation that you, uh, that you enjoy. 답변 잘 들었습니다. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, this uh, this year's conference is co-organized by Dongguk University and the Harvard Medical School uh, Medical School IPM, and that makes uh, this year's conference extra special and drawing much attention from all over the world. I'd like to offer my gratitude, deep gratitude, to to uh, the Professor Inakazan. The next is now we invite Dr. Sara Laza about uh, and president about neuroscience of meditation. Right, that because I felt like even when I wasn't meditating, that it was a having impact on me. And so I want to understand how does meditation change the brain? And so uh, the question that I've asked and what I'm going to show you tonight is can meditation actually change the structure of our brains? And the short answer is yes. But now I'm going to go into detail about how it does, it, how it happens, and how quickly it happens. So uh, one of the studies we did is we took people who were going through an eight week meditation training for stress reduction. And we looked at the structure of their brain before and after this eight week program. And we compared it to people who we just scanned eight weeks apart, but didn't do anything in between. And what we found was that there indeed, there are several brain regions where there's more gray matter after eight weeks compared to prior to training. What are these regions? So this is a posterior cingulate. It's involved in mind wandering. I'll come back to that in a moment. 
This is the supermarginal gyrus. It's involved in perspective taking and attention. So deciding where I'm going to put attention, I'm going to put attention inside my body, or I'm going to pay attention to the, out exter the external world. This is the part of the brain that's making that decision, a part of the brain that's making the decision. And then the hippocampus is involved in memory. And what we know is that these three regions together form something called the default network. And the default no network is the part of the brain that's active when you're not thinking about anything particular, like when you're mind wandering. And you might think, hmm, these are all things that should be shut off. <laughs> you know, mind wandering should be shut off when you're meditating. And what we know is that sometimes brain structure means more activity and sometimes more brain structure means less activity. And so we think in this case that more brain structure means that these regions are being turned off. And we know that this is the case. We know from other studies that these regions get turned off when we meditate. And so we think that these changes in brain structure are shutting them off. We know that this region in particular in the hippocampus, the PCC in the hippocampus are destroyed in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and one of the, the hallmarks of Alzheimer's is, you know, constant mind wandering, like you're just constantly, you're unable to focus. Um, and so this is, both of these together are suggestive that this is beneficial, these, these increases in the, the gray matter here and here. We also found down in the brainstem that this area increased and that the change correlated with well-being. So the more this area changed, the more people said that they were happier and satisfied with their life. And then the final change we found was here in the uh, amygdala. Amygdala is the part of the brain that's responsible for emotions, especially negative emotions, um, fear and uh, um, anger, these sorts of emotions. And what we saw is that it was getting smaller and that the change in the amygdala correlated with changes in stress. So the more stress reduction people reported, the smaller the amygdala became. So, um, so this was over the course of just eight weeks. Many people practice for years. And so we also did a study where we looked at the brains of people who had been meditating for many, many years and we compared them to people who had never practiced before. And we saw that there were several brain regions where there's more gray matter and the long-term meditators compared to the controls. And this main region we see here, this is involved in the insula. This is involved in uh, awareness of visceral processes. So breathing, heart rate, hunger, these sorts of things. It's also involved in integrating thoughts, senses, and emotions. Um, and it's uh, deciding what the salience, uh, you know, how important these signals are. We also found this brain region here in the front of the brain. This is an area involved in working memory and attention um, and something called fluid intelligence. I'm going to talk a lot more about fluid intelligence in a few minutes. What was interesting is that when we actually plotted the data, this is what we saw. So the red squares are the controls and the blue dots are the meditators. And it's well established that as we get older, our brain gets thinner. We start to lose gray matter and, and what uh, uh, the, the thickness gets thinner. And this is why as we get older, it takes us a little longer to figure things out or um, uh, you know, we're, just, we're not quite as sharp as we used to be. And they've shown us because of the gray matter shrinking. And what was interesting was we saw was that as you can see that in these regions, so the red decrease De decrease in the controls, this is completely normal, right? This is what many, many, many studies have demonstrated is that as we get older, it gets thinner. But what we see is that the 50 year old meditators had the same amount of gray matter as the 25 year olds, suggesting that somehow it's helping preserve this region um, uh, with aging. And here in the insula, you know, both groups went down, but the meditation group went down more slowly than the controls. Versus here, it seems like there's no loss whatsoever. So we thought this was rather interesting. And so we wondered, well, so it's preserving the gray matter, but is it actually preserving anything useful? Like, are we actually preserving cognition? So we did another study where we asked, um, Oh, where we 
looked at people with training and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But first I want to tell you a little bit more about how we thought about this. So um, we know that mindfulness meditation, that one of the common um, definitions of mindfulness meditation is paying attention to the present moment on purpose without judgment. And that first part, paying attention to the present moment uh, is really important, right? Because it's, it's uh, a lot of people have, described meditation as a form of mental training because you're sitting there and you're paying attention to your breath and it gets kind of boring right and so your mind starts to wander off and so you have to pay attention oh wait hold on a second my mind's wandering got to bring it back and then you're breathing and you're breathing and you're breathing and then your mind starts to wander again oh my mind wandered again got to bring it back and so this idea that it's a way of of training your attention right and um, so there's the, effect, the sustained attention, but there's also what's referred to as meta-awareness, which is the, uh, being able to watch your thoughts, being able to sort of step back and sort of see your thoughts as just thoughts. And so there's that part of your mind that's aware that you're thinking, right? And it's also holding in mind the intention to stay focused while monitoring for the random thoughts, right? So that the little thought comes up, and then you just let it go before your mind goes wandering off with it. Um, and then you also have to remember to maintain this attitude of non-judging and receptive openness. So mindfulness, and you're not just sitting there, right? It's a very active process because you're paying attention and you're paying attention to the fact that you're paying attention and you're keeping in mind all these, you know, to, 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 you know, to do this non-judgmentally. Um, so this is why it's called mental training. So, we know that mindfulness is really good at decreasing stress. There's been many, 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 many studies showing it decreases stress, both self-reported stress and also biomarkers of stress like cortisol. It's really effective for reducing symptoms of depression, anxiety, pain, and insomnia. And in the second half of my talk, I'm gonna be talking about pain and anxiety. But what you don't hear about too much is that it also helps cognition. There have been several studies now demonstrating that it actually improves attention. It also improves memory. Um, so episodic memory is just like facts and figures, like you know what I ate for lunch yesterday, right? Or you know memories from my childhood. Working memory is more related to um, problem solving, right? And so I've got information, and it's you know so it's 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 in my mind, and I'm keeping it in mind as I I think about things. And mental flexibility is very important um, because it's, you know, if I'm working on one task and then I need to suddenly shift and work on something else, my ability to disengage from this and re-engage in this other task, right? That's what mental flexibility is. And so all of these um, cognitive abilities have been shown to be better in long-term meditators versus control or to improve after eight weeks of training. Now, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about intelligence, right? So I told you before that that part of the brain that's preserved in the long-term meditators is involved in fluid intelligence. So there's many different kinds of intelligence. There is crystallized intelligence, which is just all the information you've ever learned. And then fluid intelligence is the ability to reason and think and solve problems. And what we know is that as we get older, just the information from our life, grows and so we gather more and more and more information and it stays fairly stable um, over our lifetime. You know, when we get into our 70s and 80s, we, we might start to have some loss of our, of our knowledge, but for the most part, it stays pretty stable. Fluid intelligence, not so much. Fluid intelligence peaks in our 20s and 30s and then it's all downhill from there, right? You know, and so we're still able to do it, but it just, it takes us a little bit longer and we're not quite as sharp again. And again, this is what's related to that front part of the brain that's shrinking with age. And so what we wondered was, um, and fluid intelligence is, is multifaceted. And so it's sustained attention, it's working memory, it's this metacognitive awareness and other executive functions. And so we wondered, okay, could we actually demonstrate this? Could we actually, you know, does meditation actually enhance fluid intelligence? Um, and so again, so this is the part of the brain that we found. And again, these are the parts of the brain. You can see these are studies that have mapped fluid intelligence. And this is the part of the brain that is most related to fluid intelligence from a bunch of different studies. 
Um, and so, and again, this is the part of the brain that shrinks with age, but is preserved in the long-term meditators. And so what we did is we gave, we recruited more subjects and everyone in our second study was between the ages of 40 and 70. And we gave them the standard test of fluid intelligence. And I should say, um, fluid intelligence is sometimes referred to as IQ, right? So this is, this is when we think about intelligence, what we're really talking about is fluid intelligence. And so what we can see in the controls is that as they got older, the performance went down, which again is very well established. We had long-term meditators and also long-term yoga practitioners. And what we see is that in both of those groups, their intelligence was preserved with older age. So it does go down a little bit over the course of the 30 years, but uh, um, you know, not very much, right? And it's, it's, uh, there's no longer relationship between age and intelligence versus here with the controls, there's a very strong correlation between, inverse correlation between age and intelligence. So it really does suggest that these practices can actually help preserve our intelligence as we get older. So this is nice, you know, all these people in the study have been practicing for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But next the question was, well, what if, you know, I'm in my 50s and 60s and 70s and I've never ever meditated before, you know, can I do anything about my memory, you know, can it actually help me? And so what we did is we recruited 120 healthy older adults. They were all 65 to 80 years old. Um, and we screened to make sure that there was no dementia, right? And there's nothing, uh, they had no, um, you know, there was no strokes or anything like that that, would, that could impact their cognition. They had no prior experience with yoga or meditation. And we randomized them to either mindfulness training or to brain games. And so brain games were things like Sudoku or crossword puzzles and, and these sorts of games. And so both classes met for eight weeks and they were told to practice every day for 40 minutes. So the meditation group practiced for meditation every day for 40 minutes and the brain games practice the crossword puzzles and Sudoku every day for 40 minutes. And um, we tested them at baseline at the end of the eight weeks and also at 12 and 24 months. And what we saw was that indeed, so from before to after, both groups improved in fluid intelligence, right? But then afterwards, at one year, the controls had gone back down to baseline versus the meditation group. Not only had they maintained, they actually got even better at fluid intelligence over the course of the 12 months. So it really shows that, you know, as you continue practicing, it has more and more benefits for you. And both groups continue to practice. In fact, the, the controls actually practice more than the meditators. Um, and so it really seems that just practicing, um, you know, even three or four times a week, so a lot of the people stopped practicing every day. They only practice say three or four times a week. Some practiced every day, um, but you know, definitely just doing any sort of practice whatsoever helped increase their intelligence over the course of the next 12 months. Um, and so the question was, okay, well, how is this working? So I told you that um, intelligence is comprised of attention and working memory and other things. And so what we also did is give them a, a, a test of sustained attention. And then again, what we see is from pre to post, both groups improved. The controls kind of sort of remained going for 12 months, but then they started to lose it. Versus the meditation group continued to increase over the course of 24 months. When we looked more closely at this data, what we saw is this. It's a little bit complicated, so I'll just walk you through it. So this is that baseline in the meditation group. And this is um, so it's a, a 16 minute task. And so they start off, you know, doing pretty well in the task, but it's a boring task. And so after about five, 10 minutes, their performance starts to drop off. And by 15 minutes, you know, their performance has dropped off quite a bit. This is that baseline. At the end of the eight weeks, they're doing a little bit better. You know, they start off higher, you know, but they still dropped off pretty much the same. What was interesting is that at one year and two year, their ability to maintain their performance over the course of the 16 minutes was much better preserved. 
right? So if we draw lines over the this, what we see is that you know on you know here you know over the, they couldn't even maintain their attention over 16 minutes, and so not only is the overall performance getting higher, but they're also able to maintain it for a longer period, right? And so if you've ever something really boring, you know that yeah, after five or ten minutes you're bored and you start to get distracted. And what this is really showing is that no, they're able to actually preserve, you know, for longer periods compared to baseline. In the controls, we didn't see this. The, um, the rate of decline was the same at baseline as uh, at 24 months. So they never, they never gained the ability to flatten the curve. Um, so this really helps us understand how it is that meditation is helping preserve fluid intelligence. Because what we're seeing is that it's it's both increasing your ability to pay attention and it's also helping you to pay attention for longer periods of time continuously, right? So you don't get tired and you know you don't get mentally tired so much. Um, okay, so that's cognition. So now we're gonna switch to talk about stress, anxiety, and pain. So uh, the definition I mentioned of mindfulness is perfectly paying attention to experiences in the present moment in a non-judgmental way. And I wanna pay attention to that last bit, the non-judging. So uh, another word I'd like for non-judging is equanimity. And so what is equanimity? Equanimity is a sense of balance, the sense that, you know, it doesn't matter what's happening. Can I be okay? Can I be balanced regardless of what's happening? Doesn't matter if really wonderful things are happening or really horrible things are balancing. Can I maintain my balance? And it's a very important that it's not that you're indifferent, right? It's not like, oh yeah, whatever happens. Equanimity, there's a deep sense of caring, right? So you care that someone has been injured or you care that you know, things are not going well in the world right now. It's, um, but you can still remain non-reactive and, and equanimous, right? And this is really what we're trying to cultivate with mindfulness meditation. So it's this, this very even-minded um, and relaxed and open awareness. And the question is, can we actually show this? Can we actually demonstrate this in the brain? And so I'm gonna talk about pain and anxiety as examples of this. So the first study was done by my student, Tim Gard. And so first let's talk about pain and how pain is processed in the brain. So here's a brain, here's the front of the brain, right? Here's your eyeball. Uh, and so what happens is say uh, you cooking and you burn your finger, the painful stimulus will come in through your fingers into the um, spinal cord. It goes up the spinal cord into the part of the brain called the thalamus. And then there's two components of pain. Um, one component of pain is the actual sensory experience of the pain. So the burning, stabbing, tingling, throbbing, right? There's that component of the pain. The other part, component of the pain is that, ow, I don't like it. Why did this happen to me? Make it stop, right? So there's the emotional component of the pain. And what we see is that this blue network is primarily the um sensory component of it right so there's the the burning sensation itself and then here in the front of the brain is this again this executive control network that um turns off um i'm jumping ahead sorry which is related to the i don't like it make it stop right and what we know is that there's lots of different ways to control pain so i can distract you I can manage your expectations and say, oh, you know, uh, this isn't gonna hurt, right? Yeah, you know, there's gonna be a little bit of pinch, but you know, like when the doctor gives you a shot, like, oh, there's gonna be a little pinch of pain, but it's nothing, no big deal. Or I can use a placebo. I can put a cream on you and say, hey, there's something in this cream that's gonna block the pain. And in reality, there's nothing there, but if you believe me, um, you'll report there's less pain. And what we know is that in all three of these cases, what happens is that the front of the brain literally shuts off this part of the brain, the sensory part of the brain, so that when the information comes up, you just don't feel it. It just doesn't come into the sensory network. And so you don't feel the pain because it's not being processed. So the question is, what happens with meditation? Because I know that meditation is useful for helping with pain. So what we did is we put people in the scanner and we applied a very mild electric shock to their hand. 
And so we had them uh, just lie there and we said, okay, you're just gonna be, for the next minute you're, or 40 seconds, you're gonna be shocked periodically. And they didn't know when the shock was happening. And then uh, afterwards they were asked to rate it both the intensity of the pain and the unpleasantness, right? So both the sensation of it and the emotional reaction to it um, on, a, on a 10 point scale. And what we saw is that here's the front of the brain. So now we're looking from above. Here's the front of the brain, right? This is the part of the brain that shuts off sensory cortex. And we see is in the controls that, so first we did this in a normal state, and then we said, do this in a mindful state. And the controls, they didn't know what mindfulness was. So we just said to them before they went in the scanner, okay, well, just be aware of it, you know, and try to be aware of it. And what we saw is that in their mindful state, which was not very mindful, that they turned on this part of the brain versus the mindfulness practitioners is actually the other way around. They turned this part of the brain off, right? So this is the, I don't like it, make it stop, right? So literally your brain, turn, this comes on to shut off sensory cortex. What was interesting is now here we got sensory cortex, right? So this is the part of the brain that's actually evaluating, okay, what am I feeling? And what we see is that in the controls, it gets turned off, right? So the front of the brain did its job and it shut it off a bit. But in the mindfulness practitioners, we're actually seeing increased activity, right? So that this, they're actually feeling it more. And so now when we first did the study, we thought, hmm, isn't this interesting? What's going on here? But then we remembered the um, instructions for mindfulness. Mindfulness is pay attention, to sensory experience in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And this is exactly what we're seeing, right? So they're paying attention, they're paying attention to it more. And, oops, go back. They're doing it non-judgmentally, right? So this is the judgy, I don't like it, make it stop, right? So they turned this off and they turned up the sensory cortex. But amazingly, they reported no change in the intensity. Right. So even though they were feeling it more, they didn't say that they were feeling it more. And they said that the unpleasantness was less. So even though they're feeling it more, like the more of the sensory signal is coming through, they're saying, yeah, you know, on a scale of one to 10, it's not as unpleasant as it was when I wasn't meditating. Right. And so this is equanimity. Right. So here it is. They're really feeling it. It's not indifference. They're really feeling it. They're really letting the emotions in or the, the sensory experience in. And yet it's not so bad. Right. And so we can now see this in the brain. Um, what was interesting is that the more experience the people had, the more years of meditation practice they had, the more they turned off the front of the brain. Right. So that part of the brain the better ability to turn that off um, occurred with the more meditation practice. So uh, to wrap up this part of the talk, life is painful, suffering is optional, right? And this is really important because no matter how much you meditate, sometimes you're gonna encounter pain in your life, right? Either physical pain or emotional pain. You, we cannot change the pain, right? We cannot stop the pain, but we can change our relationship to the pain, right? And so this is what this is saying is that, yeah, we're gonna experience pain no matter what. Meditation will not stop that. But meditation helps us not suffer because of the pain, right? We don't have to go around saying, oh, this hurts so much, I wish it would stop. We can just be, okay, there's some pain there and I, can I be okay with it? And that's really important. And it's a big part of what meditation can do for us. So now this is pain, what about fear? You know, what about emotional pain? So for this study, this was uh, my postdoc, Gunesh. And what we did was, um, I'm going to skip through this. Uh, what we did is we put people through a two-day fear conditioning protocol. And I'll go through and explain this as we go along. And uh, what we did, so this was that baseline. And this, uh, then we put people, we randomized them to either eight weeks of mindfulness training or eight weeks of exercise and diet. Um, and then we repeated this uh, fear conditioning protocol in the scanner. And very importantly, because um, I think I showed you in my prior study, 
you know, there was no control group, right? We just had, or this control group, but they just were scanned eight weeks apart. But in this study, we thought it was really important because we wanted to know how is meditation different than other forms of stress reduction? Because we know that exercise is very, very good for reducing stress. But the question is, is all stress reduction the same, right? Is meditation the same as exercise? You know, so, you know, is there a reason, you know, why should we meditate? If exercise is good for reducing stress, why do we need to meditate? And so everyone was told that there's no control group and that both interventions were beneficial. And this is true because exercise is well known to reduce stress. The exercise group also got information about sleep and diet um, and uh, positive attitude and humor. And both groups are instructed to practice 40 minutes per day at home. So the mindfulness group practiced meditation for 40 minutes a day. The exercise group exercised 40 minutes a day. And both groups reduce stress. So this is the mindfulness group. This is the control group. And as you can see, they're both very stressed and they both reduce their stress the same amount, right? But now the question is, is it the same in the brain? Um, oh, first I should say, so it also in both groups, what we saw was that the more they practice, the more stress reduction they re reported. So the, this is a question I get a lot, like how much do I need to practice? And the short answer is the more you practice, the more you're gonna benefit. So now what's the sphere conditioning? So you probably heard about Pavlov's dogs, right? And so normally when a dog sees a bone, it's gonna salivate. When a dog hears a bell, it's just a bell. There's no response. But if every time you feed the dog a bone, you also ring the bell, the dog learns that the bell means it's gonna get food. And so then after a while, what will happen is that if you ring the bell, the dog will start to salivate even if you don't give it food, right? So this is called conditioning, where you pair something which produces a, a biological response with something that doesn't. And then you see how does, do we respond, right? How well have we learned the connection between the food and the bell? So now we did this, but instead of doing foods and bells, we did that mild electric shock again, paired with um, lights. So they were in the scanner and they saw these lights and depending on what color light they saw, they got a mild electric shock. So they learned that the lights meant they were gonna get shocked, right? And so this has, and this is a very well-established way of inducing fear because people don't like being shocked. <laughs> and so the way it looks is this is that uh, it's a two day protocol. So on the first day, first of all, they see three different colored lights and two of the colors, in this case, red and yellow, they get the shock, but the blue light, they don't get shocked. Blue light means they're safe. Um, and I'll talk about the next two parts in a little bit. So the first question is just, okay, what changes from pre to post during when, they, when they're actually getting shocked? And what we see is this, and again, it's a little complicated, so I'll talk you through it. So with the controls from baseline, this is the red light. This is the light that they're getting shocked to. This is the light they're not getting shocked to. So you can see that they're having a big, this is um, skin conductance. They're having a big reaction to being shocked, which is normal, right? After the eight weeks, they no longer responded that way, right? They, they responded more than not getting shocked but almost no difference between getting shocked and not getting shocked. Meanwhile, in the mindfulness group, there's almost no change from pre to post. And again, we thought, hmm, what's going on here? But then we remembered what happened with the pain, right? Because what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is being open and non-reactive and allowing and accepting. And what we see is, is this is what happens, is that after the eight weeks, the controls, they remember that they were gonna get shocked. And so instead of being open, uh, they shut down and they're like, okay, I'm just not going to feel it. And so they didn't feel it, right? They, that front of the brain turned off their sensory cortex and they just didn't feel it. Versus after just eight weeks, the meditation group learned not to do that. And what we saw is that the more pre and post look the same. So again, this is our equanimity. Um, the more they look the same, the more stress reduction people reported. So the more they look like this, the more stress people had, the more they look like this, the less stress people reported at post. 
Um, so it really does show that being open and equanimous, you know, to this pain is related to stress in everyday life, right? It, it really does translate the physical being okay with physical pain relates to emotional pain as well. Right? So that's the first part of it. So now what else happens? So first they learn the red and yellow light means they're going to get shocked. Then what we do is we show them the red light, but we don't shock them. And they also don't get shocked to the blue light, but they get no more information about the yellow light. They go home, they go to bed, they come back the second day. And then the second day we show them all three lights, but we don't shock them. And the question is, how do they respond to the red light versus the yellow and the blue light, right? So if they have learned this well, then the red light should look like the blue light versus if they've forgotten, then they're going to look like the yellow light. And why do we care about this? So um, this needs to be remembered, right? And we know that memory is supposed to be remembered. And we know that, um, that the hippocampus, right, which is one of the regions we saw changing from pre to post, is important for this, right? And we know that people with anxiety and depression have difficulty remembering this. So what happens is that people, let me go back here, people with anxiety and depression forget from day one to day two. So when we bring people with anxiety and depression back, they respond like as if they're still getting shocked. They've forgotten that the red light means they're safe versus healthy normal people are able to remember, okay, red light means I'm safe now. And so the red light looks like blue light versus people with anxiety and depression, red light looks like yellow light. Um, and it's all dependent on the hippocampus. So the question was, okay, well, what happens with MBSR, with the training? And what we see is that indeed, the mindfulness group um, was better able to remember the, that the red light meant that they were not gonna get shocked compared to the controls. So the controls kind of sort of remembered it, but not really versus the, mind, the mindfulness group did and there was a group difference between the two, right? And then again, the question is what's happening in the brain? So this is a region that are more active in the meditators and this is the area of the hand, right? So this is where, um, so this is on the second day, they're not actually getting shocked, but what's active and what the, is attached to the hippocampus is this region here, which is the hand. And so they're paying attention to their hand while they're lying there, even though they're not getting shocked, they're still paying attention to the hand and they're not paying attention to this region. This is the area that is more active in the controls versus the meditators. And this is visual cortex, right? So the controls were paying more attention to the lights versus the meditators are paying more attention to their actual hand. And the third region we found difference, oh, and this was related to anxiety, and this is well established, that the more people are paying attention to lights and the more the visual cortex is active, the more, um, the more anxiety there is. And so the more they, they, this was uh, um, turned off, the better. And then the third reason we found was this uh, SMG, which again is one of these regions that changes after just eight weeks. And what we saw is that it was more active in the mindfulness group compared to the controls. And if you recall, this is an area that involved in deciding, do I pay attention to the outside world or the inside world? And so what we think is happening is that before or after meditation, what's happening is that this area is turning on and better trained and is saying, okay, pay attention to the sensory cortex and don't pay attention to visual cortex. And this way, then we can uh, control and be more uh, aware of, right? So paying attention to the present moment experience, you know, the actual sensory experience as opposed to the external world, which may or may not be giving you useful information. Um, and so uh, the conclusion is that the mindfulness of the body is important both for pain and fear coping and that we're shifting from thinking about and defending against threat to experiencing it openly and with equanimity, right? And that this is important for reducing stress and anxiety, right? Be, just by, by being open to life rather than shutting down. And so I wanna end with a quote from Joseph Goldstein, who's a very famous teacher here in the States. He says, anything can happen anytime. 
We may be going along just fine in our lives and suddenly there's an accident or an illness or some dramatic change in the conditions of the world. Some people may hear anything can happen anytime and think, oh, that's depressing. But rightly understood is not depressing at all. It's freeing because in understanding this, we are not living in delusion. The mind relaxes, lets go of fear, and is much more open because we acknowledge the truth of change rather than deny it, right? And now let's think about this, you know, uh, this was actually written before COVID, right? And so, um, and as we saw over the past few years that it's true, we can go along and all of a sudden something dramatic can happen, right? You know, COVID or another strain of COVID or, you know, wars and all sorts of horrible things can happen. Anything can happen anytime. We like to think that, oh yes, our life is going along and we've, you know, everything's all set and everything's going to be just perfect. But then something like COVID happens and it's like, oh no, right? And we're completely thrown off by it. But if we're open to it and saying, yeah, no, I understand life, this is how life is. And that right now, maybe everything's good, but something could happen and won't, right? And when you really are able to do that in a really profound way, then, you know, this is the truth, right? We're not living in delusion. We're living in truth and our mind relaxes and we're, let's go with the fear, right? And so we're much more able to deal with things like COVID and war and, you know, all the other, you know, climate change and all the other things that are happening in our life when we just acknowledge that this is what is true, right? So we're not trying to shut things down with the front of our brain saying, I don't like this, make it stop. <laughs> we're just open to how things are. And so with that, I will say thank you. And we have some time for questions. Uh, Dr. Sara Lazaro uh, uh, had a great, uh, one, wonderful presentation. We have a few questions. First question is, uh, I understand you also do meditation practice. Uh, could you share with us how meditation helps your research? So I practice, yes. Um, and um, it definitely helps a lot because it helps me understand. I it helps me understand what what's going on. You know, other people will say, "Oh, this is what I experienced," but by experiencing it myself, I'm better able to design my experiments and to have a sense of what's possible. Um, you know, because there's some people who just study people who've been practicing for many, many years. Many of my studies are looking at just eight weeks. And so I think it's important to understand what's capable of changing in eight weeks versus what's going to happen more slowly over many years. Um, and so I think that's part of how my practice helps me. Also, um, I've practiced both meditation and yoga, and I've practiced a couple of different types of meditation. And, you know, there's some people who say it's all the same. You know, meditation, yoga, this, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, it's all the same. But when you start to practice, you start to understand that, yeah, there's some similarities, but there's also some differences. And it helps you understand what some of those differences are and, um, you know, helps you understand the data a little bit better. Thank you for the question. This is the second question. From what I understand, neuroplasticity means that brain structure is newly formed and restructured based on our mental experiences. Uh, can this be a neuroplasticity connected with epigenetics? Um, I'm going to answer the question. I'm going to address something you said before I answer your question. Uh, actually, I'll answer your second question first. So, right. So, your question is: Is it related to epigenetics? Yes. 
um, there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that potentially, um, well, the most evidence has been shown with telomeres. So for um, chromosomes are long strands of DNA and to keep the ends of the DNA from unraveling, there's something called telomeres, which is just these proteins that wrap around the ends to keep them all tightly wound. And it turns out that um, as we age, the telomeres get shorter. And if we're stressed out or sick, they get shorter versus where they're healthy, they get longer. And there's been some studies demonstrating that meditation helps um, lengthen the telomeres. Um, I think you may hear more about that tomorrow, maybe. Um, uh, so yes, potentially there's impacts on, 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 on epigenetics. Uh, but I also want to point out, so the hippocampus is one area of the brain where you can actually get new neurons. The rest of the brain, probably it's not new neurons. Probably what's happening is that um, you can think of neurons looking sort of like trees with lots of branches and lots of roots. And so we're born with all the neurons. Most of the neurons we're going to have our whole life. You know, were born with them. But we can greatly change the number of branches and the number of roots. And we can also change where the branches are going. So the branches may be going here, but then we can move them over here instead. And so we think that that's what's happening in the other brain regions besides the hippocampus, that it's not new neurons, but it's the, the number of branches and roots and or where the branches and roots are, are uh, located. Thank you. Third question. Uh, many questions for you, especially. In the study which indicates structural changes of brain through fMRI scanning, are there possibility any cases where the contents of meditation practice are combined or overlapped? For example, one is practicing mindfulness of breathing or samatha, and then somehow they practice vipassana simultaneously. If so, it seems to be difficult to distinguish clearly which type of meditation one is practicing. With the long-term practitioners, we can't really distinguish that. Um, there have been a few attempts to do that, um, you know, but it, it's hard, especially if someone's been practicing for many years to say, okay, this is how much shamatha they practice and this is how vipassana they practice and whatnot. Uh, so, so the idea is that it's the combination of all the different practices. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's, um, and in a way, uh, because most people do practice a combination of different practices, and so it, I think it's more legitimate to show it as, a, as the sum of all their practice. Um, there have also been some studies with just eight weeks where they teach people, and we've done this as well, you know, one group gets one type of meditation and another group gets another type of meditation. And we find that there are some similarities, but there's also some differences. So I like to think of it sort of like exercise. Um, in terms of all forms of exercise are good for cardiovascular benefit, but this form of exercise might be a little bit better for your arms and this one might be a little bit better for your legs. And it seems like with the meditation and the yoga that all are generally beneficial for attention and stress, but that um, some forms of yoga or meditation might be this brain versus that brain region, or this one's maybe a little bit better for cognition and this one's a little bit better for stress maybe, but we, there's not enough data yet to say that. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and we had this. Uh, can can we have some meditation practice with you? Is it is it possible? Can you guide us a uh, meditation? Of course. It, this is great. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so uh, we'll just do a few minutes. So um, get comfortable. Uh, you can be sitting in a chair just normally. And you can keep your eyes open or closed, whatever you prefer. And uh, 
what you want to do, I like to start wide. So look around the room and get a sense of the space that you're in. And what does it feel like to be in this space? Right? So how do you know if you're in a large room, if you're there in the amphitheater, how do you, you know, what does it feel like to be in the amphitheater versus if you're at home, perhaps in a chair or in your, your office, you know, it's a, it's a much smaller space. You know, how does it feel to be in that space versus in a big space? So just getting a sense of the space around you. And then to just say like a foot or so around us, you know, like our personal space bubble, what does that space feel like? And then bringing attention into just an inch or two, a few centimeters from around our body. And what does that feel like? And now we're going to go inside our body. So bring your attention into the torso and getting a sense of all that space inside of our body. And what does that feel like? And now let's check in with our mind. Perhaps our mind is busy and active and thinking about everything you've heard. Perhaps you're a little sleepy. Perhaps you're bored. Perhaps you're thinking about something completely different. Or perhaps it's quiet and settled doesn't matter. Just notice how your mind actually is right now. And then bringing attention to breathing sensations. It might be at the nostrils, it might be in the chest, it might be down the belly. How do you know you're breathing? What are the sensations that you notice that let you know that you're breathing and alive? And as you inhale and exhale, what are the sensations? Can you feel your muscles expanding and contracting? Can you feel the flow of air through your nostrils? And just bring your awareness to that. In this open, curious, non judgmental way. And if you notice that your mind is not liking this and starting to wander, just saying, ah, oh, just for a few minutes, we're going to do this. And bringing it back gently. Perhaps sweeping attention through the body and noticing if there's any tension, letting that go. Letting the arms relax, letting the belly relax. And bringing attention back to breathing.
Noticing if you're breathing fast or slow, shallow or deep. Doesn't matter. Just knowing what you're knowing, knowing what your experience is. Noticing connection with the chair, with your feet on the ground. So whatever the sensations is, being okay with them, finding that equanimity. Now let's check in with the mind again and see how it's changed over these past few minutes. Perhaps it's still active. Perhaps it's calmed down a bit. I'm just noticing how even just a few minutes can change how your mind is. And slowly bring attention back to the surface of our body. Head to toe. And then expanding to just the space right around us, our personal space bubble. And then expanding out into the whole room. Opening eyes, wiggling fingers and toes, giving a little stretch. And just noticing how you feel now compared to how you felt 10 minutes ago. Oftentimes people say to me, oh, I don't have time to practice. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And what I see for myself is that Often when I'm really busy and really stressed out, that's when I most need the practice. And that although I might lose a few minutes of time to practice, I gain it back. Because I'll be like, oh my God, I'm busy. I've got all this to do, 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 do in my mind and I'm not really focused. But if I can practice for just a few minutes, I'm calm, I'm centered, I'm focused again. And so even though I've lost a few minutes to practice, I've gained so much more because my mind is now focused and able to work more clearly, and more effectively. So, um, uh, you know, hopefully this will uh, um, encourage you to practice, uh, even if you feel like you don't have any time whatsoever. So I think there's time for one or two more questions, maybe. From now on, um, now you have 60 minute lunch and resume the conference at 1 p.m. with Dr. Stiegelmeier, a German expert applying DBT for emotional regulation.
국제 명상 엑스포 2022 명상 새로운 세계에 오신 여러분 진심으로 환영합니다. 잠시 후 어, 학술 컨퍼런스가 다시 재개됩니다. 참석해 주신 내외빈 여러분께서는 행사장 안으로 입장해 주시기 바랍니다. 입장하신 내외분들은 앞좌석부터 착석해 주시길 부탁드리고요. 원활한 진행을 위해 소지하고 계신 휴대폰은 진동번호로 전환해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 아울러 코로나 예방을 위해 모든 순서가 진행되는 동안 마스크 착용을 부탁드립니다. 본 행사는 방역 지침을 준수하고 있습니다. 어, 그리고요 공지 사항이 있습니다. 오늘 어, 발표 연사하셨던 김종우 교수님께서 어, 코로나 때문에 현장 강의가 불가능하셔서요 줌으로 강연 진행한다고 어, 연락 오셨습니다. 그래서 갑작스럽게 진행된 점 양해 바랍니다. 네, 점심 맛있게 드셨나요? 헬로. 예, 어, 오늘 강연 계속 연락... 이어 나가도록 하겠습니다. 오전에 뭐 공부도 하시고 또 간단한 명상도 하시고 해서 어, 이모저모 배우는. We'd like to begin the afternoon session with Dr. Christian s t e g e l m a y e r We have a lot of learning packed for this day. So uh, this time in the afternoon, we will have a lecture about uh, diabolical behavior therapy. DBT was originally designed to effectively help borderline personality disorder clients with suicidal inclination. Later, its scope expanded to include motivation, reinforcement, and enhanced coping skills. Now, Dr. Christian s t e g e l m a y e r presents mechanisms of meditation in dialectical behavior therapy, self-harm, and suicide crisis. Uh, Dr. s t e g e l m a y e r please. My name is Christian Stiegelmeier from Berlin in Germany, and I'm proud to tell you something about DBT for clients with an emotion regulation disorder, especially clients with a borderline personality disorder. In the following hour, I will give you some information about the development of DBT, how DBT works, Emotion work in DBT, self compassion in DBT, efficacy of DBT, and I will close with a short summary. Here you can see the founder of DBT, Professor Marsha Linhen. She's born in Oklahoma and now she is living in Seattle. DBT is empirically generated from Marshall Linehan in the late 70s, beginning of 80s. DBT is a procedure of the third wave of behavioral therapy. And DBT has a modular structure that me, this means that different modules can be used depending on the focus of the disorder. The therapeutic focus in DBT is a treatment of an emotion regulation disorder. That means that DBT is a therapy that focuses on emotions the whole time. How DBT works. The overarching goal in DBT is to build functional strategies for emotion regulation with the goal of benevolent acceptance of oneself. So psychotherapy in DBT means that psychotherapy, that the journey, that DBT is a journey to yourself through the eye of the needle of emotions. So if the client wants to come in touch with himself, he has to get in touch with the whole range of his emotions. 
Now, the procedure in DBT is that on the one hand, you block dysfunctional behavior patterns, for example, self injurious behavior, inappropriate anger outbursts, bursts, while simultaneously you promote functional behavior patterns by teaching skills, for example, stress tolerance skills, emotion regulation skills, based on an authentic and resilient relationship. Now I will inform you sorry, about the characteristics of DBT. The D in the term the D in the term of DBT stands for dialectics. That means there's balance between acceptance and change. The B stands for behavioral. That means there is a behavioral therapy basis. And additional, DBT has an integrative approach a clear structure and hierarchy. And finally, you are always aware about your own boundaries. And if they are touched, you inform the client immediately. So as a, as a therapist, you are responsible for your own well-being within psychotherapy to be the best therapist you can be. So let's focus on what dialectic really means in DBT. To this end, I would like to show you a video in which Marsha Linehan explains how she came to develop DBT. I started working with highly suicidal people. As it turned out, the people met criteria for borderline personality disorder, but A, I had never heard of borderline personality disorder, and B, I didn't know what it was. Even if you told me the name, I wouldn't have known. So that was the beginning of the whole thing. I had no idea what I was doing, except that I was studying suicide. What happened was standard behavior therapy of the 1970s, and early 1980 blew up. And the main reason it did is because what it requires for it to work is for a person to come in and you be able to say, okay, here's the problem, and here's what we'll do to change it. And for the person to say, okay, I'll try that. But the people I was dealing with immediately said, you're saying I'm the problem. And so they were so sensitive to any invalidation or statement that they were the problem that the treatment blew up. And they would either get angry at me, hide behind a chair, storm out, quit therapy, yell and scream, cry, or say they're gonna kill themselves. So it didn't take me too long to figure out this was not gonna work out. So I thought, okay, we're gonna to switch to a more acceptance-based treatment. So I'm gonna validate and be very accepting. So I tried that. That blew up also, because then the patient said, you mean you're not going to help me? You're just going to listen to me? Most of the patients I treat have already been through a whole lot of therapy where you talk, get listened to, and understood. The problem is talking, being listened to, and being understood doesn't necessarily make anything change. So then they got really upset with me because it wasn't helping them change. So that's when I realized that I had to pull together major emphasis on change with a technology of acceptance. So I had a technology of change, now I needed a technology of acceptance. The technology of acceptance primarily was validation. So it's behavior therapy with a huge amount of validation. So problem solving, validation are the core components of the treatment. 
So how Marshallin had explained, the main dialectic in, in, in DBT is acceptance and change. So um, I would like to explain you, to you what dialectics mean in relationships. So between the therapist and the client. So at the bottom of uh, this slide, you see a titter tutter. And on the titter tutter, you see on the left the client and on the right uh, the therapist. So let's imagine the following therapeutical situation. You, as a therapist, would like to get a non suicide commitment from your client for one year. But the client immediately rejects such a commitment. On the titter tutter of the of relationship, the client takes a step back from the therapist by such a reaction. Quite often, our first reaction as a therapist is to run after the client. But what happens with the titter tutter? Exactly it loses its balance. Therefore, running after the client is not good DBT. Good DBT would be when the client goes back, that you as a therapist also goes, go back. So you always tried to find a good balance between you and the client. But that doesn't mean that when the client says no, you should just say no also. That wouldn't work. So there are two persons, one say no, and the other says no as well. Then happens nothing. There's no more movement. And one of the most important things in therapy is movement. Good there, DBT is that you try to find a good balance and additionally to bring movement in the life of the client by getting their non-suicide commitment. So you're always wandering on this titter tutter. You can ask the client, for example, if the client says no, I won't, I don't, you don't, don't get the, my commitment. So you can ask the client, okay, that's bad. So maybe we can't work together because I need this commitment. But are you inter interested in my personal opinion? And maybe the client says, yeah, yeah. What's what, what you would like to say to me? So you can tell them, Okay, I unfortunately we can't work if I don't get your, your commitment. But on the other side, I really would like to work together with you. And I'm absolutely convinced that you really can benefit greatly from DBT. But it's it's your decision. So there's a lot of movement by offering a good relationship. I really would like to work with you. But on the other hand, I need a strong commitment from you then that we can work together. Okay. So it's a little bit similar to this picture where you can, where you can find these two guys who are trying to find a balance, but in the same time, they are still moving. Okay. Next, let's focus on the term behavioral. The working tool of DBT is a behavioral analysis. And within this behavioral analysis, you try to find out what triggers the, be the behavior. That's a classic conditioning. And what maintains the behavior, so that's operant conditioning. 
to help the client to modify his behavior, you use contingency management. And contingency, contingency management refers to a strategy that seeks to change behavior by modifying its consequences. For example, whenever the client manages to go a month without hurting himself, you offer an extra therapy session. Or the other way around, the other way around, whenever the client hurts himself, one therapy session is canceled or will be shopped. That would be content G management. But what is very important, you always discuss the content G management before together with the client. So a DBT therapist always reinforces functional behavior to the relationship, but never reinforces dysfunctional behavior through the relationship. So next, next, let's have a look what an integrative approach really means. And the following approaches can be found represented in DBT. That's the, uh, the behavioral therapy, cognitive therapy, conversational psychotherapy, gestalt therapy, self-compassion techniques, and there's a lot of Zen Buddhism and mindfulness. Marshall Linehan is uh, a Zen master, but not a Buddhist. And therefore the, psycho, the, pers uh, per the perspective of Zen has highly influenced DBT. Let's take a look at what clear structure means in DBT. The most important structure and strategy within DBT is that you always focuses, focus on emotions. That means that every time an emotion comes up, you make it a topic of focus. There are, all, there are uh, four treatment stages which are structuring the DBT as a whole. And um, the, you see these four stages at the bottom of the, the slide. And the goal of stage zero is orientation and motivation. Within this stage, you are not in therapy. You're, you try to get a commitment for therapy for DBT. In stage one, you already has, have a commitment for therapy. And in stage one, the, the goal of stage one is the improvement of behavior control. That means that we block avoidance behaviors like self-interest behavior, suicidal behavior, drinking alcohol, etc., to to get contact, to get in contact to the emotions of the client. So, if we have blocked the avoidance behavior, the the emotions are present. And then we start in stage two, where we can work with the emotions who were blocked before by dysfunctional behavior. Though the, the goal of stage two is the improvement of emotion regulation the, by acceptance of the emotions. Stage three has the goal of making life worth living. Within all these stages, there is a dynamic hierarchy. First of all, you focus on life-threatening behavior. That means whenever behavior occurs, 
that could be dangerous for the client's life, you will focus on that behavior in the therapy session via a behavioral analysis and nothing else. That's the topic for this session. If no life-threatening behavior is present, the next step is to look for behaviors that could lead to an early end of psychotherapy. And if this behavior is also not present, you have a focus on severe crisis, like for example, self-interest behavior, drinking alcohol, promiscuity behavior, etc. And if this behavior is also not present, behavior that jeopardizes therapy progress is the next topic. And if none of these behaviors are present, you are free to discuss what you and the client consider as important. So, you also can have another focus on the stages. I, 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 it's a very interesting focus, a focus on the development of the client's identity. And um, the first focus, the first stage, it's stage zero, there's a, 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 um, a focus uh, uh, like, who am I? I, I yeah, the online persons ask quite often, who am I? I don't know what's going on, who am I? Stage one is I'm a borderline client. Uh, um, so there's a high identification being a borderline client. In stage two is I'm borderline and so much more. So they start to, to get rid of this stigmatization of to being borderline patient, client. And stage three mean I'm strange, but great. And the next slide shows you what exactly that mean. That means this stage three, maybe I, you know, these Japanese bells and um, they, the, if there are tracks within these bells, they are filled with gold and they get very valuable and very expensive. And maybe that's a metaphor, for example, the, 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 the goal of DBT, um, when even through the cracks, even when the, the, the cracks can be very painful, they, if they also have the potential to create something very valuable. So that's the, 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 the goal we want to reach together with the client. So let's have a look what emotion work is in DBT. What exactly means emotion work in DBT? From a client's perspective, emotions are rejected because they are perceived as uncontrollable, not experienced as appropriate. Mother always said that your, feeling, your feelings are wrong, for example, and they are quite often very painful. So, what happens when you don't want an emotion to be true or accepted? First of all, emotions get stronger. For example, fear turns into panic. Maybe someone of you has have already experienced exactly this. And emotions can come to light in other appropriate, inappropriate places that also can happen. For example, the anger towards the partner breaks out somewhere else. And finally, emotions must be regulated in a different way. 
So most lines use dysfunctional strategies to regulate emotions, for example, suicidal behavior, self-interest behavior, behavior, alcohol, drugs, high-risk behavior, binge eating, starving, etc. Conclusion. Rejection, re rejecting one's own emotion, emotions cause a lot of problems. And because emotions are the basis for identity, re rejection one's own emotions means nothing else than rejecting oneself. And a significant part of life energy is used to reject emotions and thus oneself. The result is there's a lot of suffering. Now, how are emotions dealt with in DBT? In general, with increasing therapy dura duration, the proportion of emotion activation and thus emotion exposure becomes more extensive. So in stage two, there's more emotion act activation than in stage one and in stage three is more emotion activation and, expo and exposure than in stage two. The first thing, thing to do is to clear the way to the primary emotion. That's the goal of stage one. To reach this goal, you have to block dysfunctional behavior which the client has used so far for emotion regulation. To be able to block, block this functional behavior, the clients need crisis survival skills, as for example, using cold water, tightening and relaxing different muscles of the body, standing on a wobbly surface with one leg, eating chili, drinking lemon cheese, a little bit softer than eating chili, using ammonia inhalant, breathing, especially exhaling, the skill I love very much, and distracting activities like, for example, playing computer games or doing housework, etc. This slide shows you a skills chain. And the chain starts with a very effective crisis survival skill, like for example, ammonia and ammonia inhalant. Then next, the client could use, for example, uh, cold water. That's the skill number two. Then he could call his therapist, that is skill number three. And finally, he uses an emotion regulation skill. So the goal is to handle the emotion which is responsible for the increase of aversive tension. So it's not necessary that the client only uses a crisis survival skill. He always has to use an emotion regulation skill as well. So there are three focuses in emotion work. The first focus is perceive and mark. That means whenever an emotion is perceptible or noticeable, it is addressed. The second focus is describe. That means perceiving and describing the emotion. If you name it, you tame it. So there comes up a distance to the emotion. And the third focus is 
participate, that means experiencing the primary emotion. If you feel it, you heal it. That's exactly what we do when we do trauma therapy. So the message from the therapist to the client on the, when he is doing emotion work is, I trust you to endure such emotions. The primary emotion is appropriate. I am there for you and accompany you even in your most emotionally difficult hours. And you are welcome with your emotions. That's my message, message to the client. And the target behavior of the client I want to reach together with him by doing this emotion work is be a poor, polite host who opens the door right when there is a knock at the door. Ah, it's you. Welcome. And crying and sobbing, you have brought two. Come in and sit down, sit down by the fireplace and tell me all about it. But what happens now when you let in a previously avoided, mostly unpleasant emotion? Right, there comes up a lot of pain. It really can hurt you. How this pain can be, how can this pain be dealt with? The most effective way to deal with this kind of pain is the practice of self-compassion. There are three main pillars of self-compassion. The first one is mindfulness. That means in order to respond to our need, we must know that we are suffering right now. The second pillar is self-friendliness. That means to treat oneself with kindness, care, and understanding. And the third pillar is common humanity. That means everyone suffers or makes the experience of not being perfect. So we are not alone with our pain. So to summarize, self-compassion is a state of loving, connected presence. And what is very important, we practice self-compassion, not so much with the goal of feeling better, but because we feel bad. But take care. We open the door of our hearts and the fresh air of self-compassion flows in. All pain and fears likely campaign to come out. That was mentioned from Chris Neff and Chris Germer, who are the founders of Mindful Self-Compassion. Um, so at the very beginning of the practice of self-compassion, there may even be an aggravation for a while, but it's your job as a therapist to make sure that the, that the aggravation doesn't get too big. And therefore, so there are some requirements you, uh, before you start to teach self-compassion. I recommend that there's no more severe dysfunctional behavior, like deep cuts, for example. Uh, the client should be able to use distress tolerance skills if there's too much stress. Uh, he should, should be able to regulate his emotions. 
he should be able to use mindfulness skills to detect pain if there is pain. And he should have a minimum of one better two stable social relationships he can contact if there is stress. So now I would like to introduce you to a basic exercise that I use quite frequently in DBT. First, you have to recognize that this is a moment of suffering. For this, it can be helpful to localize emotional pain in the body. Most clients say pain is right here in the breast. In the sense of common humanity, suffering is part of life. That means that I'm not alone with my pain. And for this, it can be helpful to place a hand on this area you have detected right before. And this creates warmth and body contact. And finally, self-friendliness by benevolent coaxing. That means you could say to yourself, may I accept myself as I am? May I accept myself as I am? And that could get, become a, a routine that you do with a client whenever there is a painful moment, a painful, unpleasure emotion. So let's focus on a special topic uh, within the psychotherapy with borderline patients, and that's the emotion shame. That's a very unpleasant uh, emotion um, that most clients experience quite often. So to understand why this emotion is so important for these clients, we have to understand the function of, of shame. And one of the most basic needs within, uh, with, in, in childhood is to be loved, especially in childhood, but also in adulthood, is to be loved and, and to belong. But unfortunately, most of our clients have had the experience of not being loved and belonging. And if they, if, if, if they don't get as much love as they need, the thought comes up, I'm wrong the way I am. Otherwise, I would be loved. Therefore, I'm different from others. And that is, this is existential shame. I'm different from others, alienation. The result of this unfulfilled need is a permanent search for love and belonging in the outside, in the outside world. But unfortunately, unfortunately, in the adult world, unconditional love no longer exists. Therefore, the client has to accept that no one will be able to meet those needs that they uh, parents normally should have done. And this causes a lot of pain. And therefore, a lot of self-compassion is needed to handle this pain, which may come up right in this moment. So self-compassion is the antidote to shame. So let's close the short look at the efficacy of DBT. 
And um, in a recent meta-analysis, including 24 randomized control trials, there were moderate to strong effect sizes with respect to self-interest behavior, suicidality, and mental health. By far, the most efficacy studies are available for DBT, followed by mentalization-based therapy with seven studies. So there's a big difference between in the, concerning the numbers of randomized control studies. So based on the current studies, only DBT and MBT are recommended as evidence-based methods for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. We are all we were so we, we were interested about the effectiveness of outpatient DBT under normal supply content conditions here in Berlin, and we have done a study from 2007 to 2010 and included 47 clients. Most of them were females, and they have got outpatient DBT for one year. And uh, I don't want to take too much time for this slide, but the most important results are, there is a significant reduction in self-interest behavior, as well in the number of inpatient days. Uh, days. And, um, Another very important result is that 77% of the clients no longer fulfill the borderline diagnosis after one year of DBT. I, I think that's a quite impressive result. Another result we have uh, got from our study is uh, regarding uh, is that the costs, that there's a significant reduction of the costs clients causes within the welfare system. So outpatient DVT reduces costs to nearly half. That means that every euro invested in DBT saves two euros. Okay, let's close with a short summary. DBT is an empirically generated psychotherapeutic method of the third wave of behavioral therapy. DBT is an emotion focusing therapy and in order to be able to work with the client's emotions, the first thing to do is to put an end to previously dysfunctional behaviors for emotion regulation and the whole rest of therapy, you focus on the emotions of that client. Mindfulness and self-compassion are necessary components for treating clients with BPD and DBT is effective for treating clients with borderline personality disorder and clients with an emotion regulation disorder. Thank you very much for your attention. 네. Thank you. Uh, DB, Dr. Christopher. Christian Stiegelmeyer presents uh, and DBT uh, uh, originally designed to effectively help borderline personality disorder clients with a suicidal inclination. Thank you for your inspiring presentation. 
The next presenter is Dr. Kim Jong-woo, a doctor of oriental medicine specializing in neuropsychiatry at Gyeonggi-dae, uh, the Korean Medical Hospital. The title of his presentation is um, Mechanisms of Mechanisms of Meditation in Oriental Medicine. I'm afraid that we have a change uh, since he suddenly is diagnosed of the uh, co co uh, COVID-19 that that, oops, sorry, that, that he is going to join us uh, on Zoom. But we're going to have first have a break, and we're going to start at 2 p.m. with uh, Dr. Kim Jong-un.
강연 이어가도록 하겠습니다. Uh, the Dr. Kim Jong Un's presentation will start at 2 p.m. Did you have a good break? Let's invite Dr. Kim Jong-un, the professor of Oriental Medical School. He will make a presentation on meditation mechanism and oral medicine. Again, we like to inform you that there is a slight change in the program that he has to join us through Zoom instead of to be here in person. Thank you. I'm Chong Woo Kim. Shall we start? First of all, I'd like to offer an apology. I was just I just had a test this morning. I was tested positive of coronavirus. So I really was looking forward to meeting you in person, but I'm afraid that I had to meet you online. I am a doctor of oriental medicine. And I also was a chairperson of the, uh, the, the Meditation Association. So I'm used to how they are connected. But the, today's theme is the meditation and science. So I uh, look into how to connect these two disciplines. So let me share the screen. I'm a, a professor at the Kyung the, the Kyung University, I was teaching Oriental medicine. We believe that Qigong is similar to meditation in Oriental medicine. So traditionally, they are developed. Both develop, are developed in Asia. Both are to tra developed to train mind. Uh, they are originated in India from India and China, but it has been very widespread in Asia. There are quite a lot of similarities, so is I think it is relatively easy to integrate them. For instance, the Tantian breathing of Qigong 
the really uh, emphasizes on the calmness, sitting, and breathing. If we try to find differences, the meditation is Buddhist or uh, oriented, whereas the Qigong has a Taoist origin and focus more on having uh, mind and body health. But ultimately, both are designed to train mind using breathing and also use breathing to con regulate the state of mind. So ultimately, there are more similarities than differences. So this is uh, what we're going to look into today that we will see how the mechanism of meditation is viewed in oriental medicine. So I will share the theory as well as my own experiences. And I will introduce how meditation is connected to the oriental medicine. And I will tell you about Qigong practice. So, like I say, I'm an oriental medicine doctor. And in oriental medicine, we do teach medical Qigong. It's a part of the formal curriculum. It is based on the what we call life nurturing techniques. It's the, it's, uh, this, the life nurturing is a way to make sure your both body and mind is, is, keeps them healthy. And after I graduate the medical school, school, I also personally practiced Shaorin Nejin Ni Chi Chen. It's, this is a uh, uh, originated from Shaolin Temple in China. I practice it and also wrote a paper on it. I am also teaching meditation. I'm a certified meditation teacher. I was a uh, chairperson. I also served as a chairperson of the Korean Society for Meditation. This, the Korean Society for Meditation, if I may introduce this organization, this is the organization of the people who are working in the, the health care. And they, they, these are the people in the healthcare interested in meditation. We also had a uh, the curriculums to train meditation experts, and we also certify them. I. Oh, we, we, I'm also the chairperson of the Oriental Medicine Mental Health Center. I'm a director. So I wrote the papers on Oriental Medicine and the mental health. I also wrote a book. And so we, I mean, so, so my main focus is how to use oriental medicine to help uh, help the patients with their mental health. So I use the breathing, as you can see, relaxation methods, mindfulness, to train them to sense key better. So it's all kind of amalgam of all these different methods. So let me tell you more about meditation and oriental medicine. Until 1980s, the Qigong is more widely known in Korean society than uh, meditation. The, f the public find the Qigong more familiar. Qi because Qigong has always been part of the oriental medicine, but meditation was more confined to the Buddhist temples. Qigong started in China. But Qigong has been 
it more or less been kicked out of the Chinese medicine circle because of the Pal Yun Gong uh, debacle. And Pal Yun Gong focuses, focuses, focused on the controlling mind. So the Qigong's uh, more, the, Qigong, the side of the Qigong that focuses on movement or breathing were now being used. The Liu Ji Ju or Ba, uh, ba Down Jin which foc and Tai Chi were focusing on the breathing and movement are being widely the, the practiced. The mind training aspect of the Qigong is now being discouraged. Meditation became secularized in the US after the introduction of MBSR. And since then, it's being widely used in in medicine as well as in psychological therapy. And there are lots of uh, academic research done on this uh, subject in the West. Uh, so let me tell you more about the similarities and differences of the Qigong and meditation. We all know that meditation is a method of self-regulation training that emphasizes attentional awareness in order to control mental state. It aims to improve overall mental well-being and develop skills such as calmness, increased clarity, and concentration. In oriental medicine, it has the similar goal to keep mental health improve it and prevent mental illnesses. The oriental medicine also aim to the optimal state to, to by increasing the patient resilience. So in that sense, uh, it, they're, they're very similar. And let me look at the mechan mechanisms of meditation to compare it to the, the oriental medicine. The, I think the first mechanism of the meditation is the decentering. De instead of being, I, instead of identifying the my experiences, uh, we to take a step back and just observing it with no judgment. It's, there's a similar attitude in oriental medicine. The balance and harmony is the central uh, the key to healing and health. And also, in human cognitive process, paying attention is the very, very first step. So all the the mental process start by paying attention. And also, the self-regulation is another key to meditation. So we keep paying attention to our inner uh, experiences, and it helps self-regulating. And the oriental medicine also focuses on keeping the equanimity by keeping the inner experiences balanced and harmonized. And the meditation just uh, trains the mind to notice the ex present experience that it is. And especially the bodily sensations that helps to connect the body and mind. This connection of body and mind is also the central. The key, in fact, is the, met, uh, is the, the, the medium that con it, it integrates the body and mind. So in that sense, the, the key is the most important medium that the, the oriental medicine work with to keep the human beings, both mind and body, healthy. And meditation is a, a wisdom practice. You keep observing what's going on inside of you. And oriental medicine 
also believe that this self-realization of the wisdom, I mean, we call it different ways. We don't call it enlightenment, but we call them kunja or saint or jinin is the, the fully realized human being. And Oriental medicine, like the Buddhism, like a Buddhism uh, goal is to attain enlightenment. The self-realization, the full understanding of oneself is an important goal of Oriental medicine. Let me let me teach you some of the terminologies we used in oriental medicine. This is also related to I think meditative work. These are also the things that we talk about with the, the patients on the subject of uh, the the mental health. Although they are the oriental medicine terms, they are quite similar to what meditation pursue. Like for instance, the harmony between human being and the nature is extremely important. And the balance between yin and yang is the basis for everything. And we believe how body and mind should be connected and integrated. And the key, the one of the key roles of key is just that. And we believe that there are five important organs. And the number one of these five is the heart. So interestingly, the character for heart is same as the character for mind in uh, Chinese character. So, and, and when we make an examination, the in the di when to make a diagnosis in oriental medicine, we do four things, and they are singing, hearing, and asking question, and sensing the pulse, and that they all in they all involve the high levels of mindfulness and awareness. Uh, we use the term four key and five flavors to explain that this is how we categorize the uh, medicinal herbs. And when we connect meditation and the oriental medicine, the first is, like I say, key. Key is always the key uh, subject we discuss when we try to connect meditation and oriental medicine. It is still very hard to have a clear operational definition of what key is. Uh, most commonly now, the key is considered to be an energy, and is now being ex its use is being extended to quantum physics and medicine. However, the probably one of the most difficult uh, issue in oriental medicine is how to me define a measure key is one of the the, the obstacle this 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 the problem of measurement the quantify it is what makes it rather difficult to make the study of key more widespread in the world of science and the like I mentioned, qi, there are many, many similarities between Qigong and meditation. As you can see, there are three coordinations of Qigong. What is to be coordinated in Qigong is body, mind, and breath. So how to, how to regulate body, how to regulate mind, how to regulate breath is quite comparable to MBSR. 
So you can see that the MBSR has sitting meditation, yoga, walking meditation, which is uh, equivalent to the coordination, body coordination. And there is a breathing meditation. And there is the, uh, the awareness meditation, mindful meditation. This is all equivalent to the coordination of mind in Qigong. And the Qigong also teaches you how to sense ki, accumulate ki, and circulate ki. And the, especially the to sense ki is, is developed, cultivated by relaxing your body and just notice what's going on in your body, which is quite similar to the mindfulness training. I'm a meditation teacher, especially when I teach meditation to the oriental medicine doctors. I teach them to use qi as an important meditation medium. It's, it's a, they amplify each other when you when you sense ki, which is an important part of the Qigong training, I ask them to use mindfulness techniques. So we, I mentioned that because of the Paryun Gong debacle, which is being now persecuted by the Chinese government, that the the the, as, the mental training aspect of the Qigong is now kind of disappearing, and now the the only the movement, the body, or the breathing aspects of the Qigong are being encouraged. Nevertheless, even though nowadays Qigong training focuses more on the body and breathing, it is still recognized that without the mind training, the, it, it is hard to be more developed in Qigong practice. So there are now uh, the tr the attempts to to create new practices, Tai Chi or Qigong practices. So in the Oriental medicine, the the heart uses the same character as mind, and that's the heart of not only of your body, but also it is part part of heart of the, the key the center of your mind. So both mind and body is being understood as organized around the heart. So we understand heart as an organ is the second brain. So heart is not just the, the chunk of muscle that pumps the blood, that it is also the, it plays a central role in the function of the mind. That's how Oriental medici medicine understands heart. Let me introduce to a study, what we say Qigong or meditation. We believe that they are to achieve calmness and vitality. So while my, the mind is relaxed, there still has to be this kind of clarity, the energy, vitality. It, 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 actually, they may look like opposing terms, but can these two rather opposing states can be achieved by Qigong or meditation. So this study look into if it is possible. According to this study, so we taught them this Qigong training called Ba Dao Jin, 
focuses more on breathing and uh, movement. And the study shows that that while it activates body and mind and keep your body more energized and vit uh, keep full of vitality, at the same time, the, your the parasympathetic system modulation improves as well, which means that the while your body is more energized, your mind gets calmer. So even though this calmness and vitality may sound like uh, conflicting with each other, it is the goal that can be attained in reality. So if you meditate with Qi, that's the, the subject of my study. I made a four a 15 minute a key meditation program so you have supposed to do it 15 minutes every day and you come you meet get together every week uh, you meet every week and have more intense training but the majority of it is 15 minute short four week uh, qigong based meditation so so i taught them breathing and how to sense chi and the autogenic training so so it's a short 15 minute meditation of these uh, with these three components and the subjects are those who have an anger problem anger control problem I mean, they ha they can have uh, the depression or anxiety disorder, but the, they all have a problem with the anger control. And the study shows that all these symptoms has been reduced. And as the key practice, Qigong practice is combined with meditation, I believe that even though it was very short, only 15 minutes, that it created a meaningful result. Now, let me introduce the scientific research into Qigong. I have uh, I was going to introduce meditation separate from Qigong but I'm not going to introduce you about meditation because there are many 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 other experts already uh, presenting on meditation so I will focus more on the research on Qigong scientific research on Qigong the Qigong we the in oriental medicine we use Qigong in a very very similar to meditation the way meditation is used in Western medicine these days but like I mentioned to have more scientific research into Qigong, the first step is how to define it and how to measure it. Uh, that is one of the biggest obstacles. Most of the, the studies, nevertheless, are done with Qigong or uh, Tai Chi with uh, defined parameters of the movement. And I believe that we can learn a lot from the process how meditation becomes the subject of science. Uh, 
in the West. Psychology, in particular, uh, really played a role of bridge uh, to make meditation a part of science. And the psychology did a lot to come up with operational uh, definition of what meditation is and develop various programs to quantify the scientific effects of meditation. I look into the um, make a comparison of trends and research of Qigong and meditation, and you can see there are 10 times more academic research done compared to that of Qigong. And while this research on meditation is increased exponentially, the Qigong, the number of studies done on Qigong is st stay more or less same. So now, Meditation is not considered to be separate from science. The, 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 the book I introduce you is uh, written in 2016, explaining how meditation is science. The meditation is no longer stays within the esoteric world of temple. Meditation came out of temple and meet, met the science. And it's now equipped with a clear operational definition, which allows quantifiable evaluation. Also, the meditation have met the brain science, the neuroscience. And now that we have MBSR, and since then, its effectiveness is scientifically proven. So now it's become a mainstream research in science. Now, when it comes to Qigong research, as you can see, Qigong has mainly three forms, movement form, static form, and standing form. And most of the research focuses on movement form. But Qigong is a very big umbrella term. There are many different practices in what can be termed as Qigong. You can categorize as Qigong. Like I say, the Tai Chi and Badao Jin are the two most prevalent Qigong practice. So let me introduce some of the studies, academic research on Qigong. And they attempt to come up with the ways to define a major key. And st here, the problem has not been fully resolved yet. We do have epistemological and ontolo ontological uh, definition we use, but neither of them has so solved the question of the key really exist. How can we quantif measure and quantify it? Uh, there are many researchers attempting it, but uh, there are more questions than answers. So there are the programs being developed with a clear instruction on movement. Uh, it, 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 this, what, what you're now showing you is a protocol designed to improve mobility and the balance self-confidence. Uh, they are 
made of a set of simple movements. And the study shows that they have a positive effect on the older of the, the population they're designed for. Now, let me look at the study that look on the more meditative aspect of Qigong. It's called Im Imaginary Working Qigong, using the more mental activity. Well, it's actually, it hasn't done yet. It hasn't published yet. Only the, it's at the protocol uh, stage. Anyway, so, the, the Qigong research on its mental or meditative aspect is still quite limited. And the effectiveness and mechanism of Qigong, we have a study on the neurophysiological and psychological mechanism of Qigong as a treatment for depression. But I don't think that the, the study has answered all the questions about the mechanisms of the Qigong. However, it did show how the how the Qigong can help the uh, the the emotional self regulation as well as the HP the activation of HPA axis in the brain. And it does help how the, how the Qigong helps the parasympathetic regulation. But despite the, the existence of such research, if we look at the research and Qigong study, it really also rely on the psychological model of the mechanisms of mindfulness that they, uh, they, they base their research on the hypothesis that Qigong has the same psychological mechanism with uh, mindfulness or meditation. In other words, by paying attention to the movement or breathing, which is as part of the Qigong, by tracking and following the breathing and movements uh, with your attention, that the Qigong can be effective. So a lot of Qigong research base their uh, hypothesis rely on the meditation mechanism, thinking that it shared the same mechanism. That's the hypothesis. So in the sense, Even there, there are lots of Qigong study conducted, like such as the Qigong and cancer, and Qigong and stress, Qigong and fatigue, Qigong and sleep, depression, pain, how to improve the quality of life. So there is a, a wide variety of application Qigong has or uh, being explored. I am teaching Qigong to the cancer patients quite often. Let me give you an example. So it's a re re relaxation and breathing. It's part of the meditation. They are two of the first things we teach when we teach meditation. So 
Qigong is similar in the sense we first teach uh, breathing and relaxation. And in meditation, after relaxation and breathing, to integrate meditation into your everyday life, we teach them walking meditation. A walking meditation is quite useful to cancer patients because they experience a sudden loss of appetite. They have a hard time eating food for various reasons. So in the sense, we teach them, because of that, we teach them eating meditation. And if, we, if they can walk, it is really helpful if they're in it condition to move their body. It is very helpful for the cancer meditation to walk. So that is the next step that we teach to the cancer patient, the eating meditation and walking meditation. And if you can walk regularly with a uh, relaxed and calm and joyful mindset, that is really helpful uh, way to manage their illness. So that is the second step. And the next step is, is the, I, I just introduced the 15 minute Qigong based meditation. And part of that 15 minute meditation, the Qigong based meditation is sensing key. That is the third step. So you first relax your body and you feel uh, the, the, the heat on your palm and by putting palms uh, facing each other but apart you can feel how the key travels from one palm to the to the other and once you start feeling the sensing the key that you can that a key in your hands to reduce the part of your body that is feeling pain. So the three step uh, Qigong uh, practice I teach to the cancer patients, the relaxation breathing, eating and walking meditation, and the sensing key practice. And we have a Qigong study that is measuring the effects of Qigong. That we don't have uh, that many study that has any drastic uh, medical effects, but we do have study that shows that it is effective in stress management and sleep management. And there are two, two Qigong related research dealing with the diseases treated by Qigong. There are various syndromes and the bodily illnesses. Uh, that are studied by these papers, Qigong papers, and there are, but unfortunately, uh, there are only limited research done on the effect of Qigong on the mental health, like I explained, because of the situation in China. I. I am the director of Korean Medicine Mental Health Center, and they have developed a mental health program. Uh, and when we did that, we used Qigong. But again, we must have come up with definitive ways to define and measure 
key. We are working on it. And the 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 key. So as a substance of such definition, we are now trying to come up with the ability to sense, accumulate, and circulate key. And, and from there, we are now developing tools and, and, and programs to increase these three abilities, the sensing and uh, accumulating and the circulating key. Another area that we are focusing on is the study on movements. So we try to analyze each movement of Tai Chi and what movement works for what to, to have a more clear categorization. Like for instance, what movements of Tai Chi is better for muscular skeleton uh, related Ill symptoms or what movement is more effective for mental conditions. And also, we are studying how the Qi Gong can help life, life nurturing. Life nurturing focuses on prevention of diseases and longevity. The life nurturing is done by increased life energy. And what is mostly used for that are acupuncture and the oriental medicine. But um, we are looking into the way to use Qigong practice as part of this life nurturing. And now also we are looking into how to make it into mo more Qigong practice, more modern program programs. Especially for mental health, and these uh, Qigong program programs for mental health will have a strong meditative component. And these are all being developed by my center. So while I'm preparing for this presentation, uh, I had a chance to give it a fresh look on do they share the same goal or are there any dif differences? I mean, in the old days, there are only two areas of, of research, humanities and na natural science. And but these days, the things that are not being scientifically verified are being looked down upon. And the, the oriental medicine or Korean medicine is now asked to have a more scientifically verifiable uh, research. All the key concepts of the oriental medicine, such as life nurturing, the key, or the, f the, the five elements, the four constitutions, because they're still not being fully verified by science, they are getting more and more becoming individual practice. But this is the requirements of the age. So this is what we are called to achieve, that we need science. Nevertheless, this the the Qigong still has a, its own path, its own dreams, its own world, which can benefit p patient as well as ordinary citizens. At the same time, by integrated with being integrated with science, there will be new developments and new ways that oriental medicine will find. So, 
we we published a book on meditation and while we publishing the book we ask the experts what meditation is and there are many different answers it's about being calm it's about being free from thinking it's about awakening it's about a way to get to the truth etc etc these values these goals the meditation pursue is almost same as what uh, oriental medicine pursues the post meditation and oriental medicine or korean medicine uh, aims to achieve the optimal body mind state and in turn re reach the happiness re lasting happiness so when we reach when you when your mind reach a calm optimal state your body also uh, reached optimal state when your body reaches optimal state your mind also reaches optimal state and So while preparing for this presentation, we had lots of discussions in our center. And these are the people I owe a lot. The, I'd like to offer thanks to Dr. Yoon Seo Gin, who is the who is a psychologist, and I would like also thanks uh, Jackie Shin, who is studying Tai Chi in Indiana State University, who is also a P has a PhD in psychology, and that just uh, to what I presented to say to uh, today is the result of the discussion I had with them. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Kim jong woo presenting on Korean medicine and Qigong and meditation. Now we will ask question. The first question is, it seems Qigong can come and bring peace to mind and body. However, it also appears that without fundamental healing of mind, things just return to previous state. What solution oriental medicine has for this? Thank you for asking the question. As I mentioned earlier, the key gong used to have a significant part that deals with mind. However, since 2000, early 2000, it, the, and the, because of Park Yun-gong debacle, Chinese government start persecuting that aspect of Qigong practice. So mind training aspect of Qigong is quite restricted now. <laughs> But in reality, according to old texts, the mind training is an essential part of Qigong. In fact, to make the optimal bodily state, physical state, this, the mental tr without mental training, it's impossible to achieve. I understand there are many Buddhists here. If you look at the key, a key, a mental, a key te Qigong teaching about mental training is extremely similar to meditative practice. It's almost practically identical. According to old, uh, the oriental medicinal text, it says that when the people reduce the desire and attachment, 
and to the point that your mind is free from greed and desire, naturally your body will be free from diseases and you will be one with the path. You will be one with the past. The past will reveal itself to you, and you will be one with the past. Doesn't it sound like a Buddhism? I started my career as a oriental medicine doctor, but I started meditation early on. Uh, and I rely upon meditation for mental training. But there are valuable mind training methodology in Qigong too. So I expect that the, there will be exchanges between Buddhist meditation and Qigong mind training so that they can amplify the positive effects. Thank you very much for joining us despite your poor health. And now we will have a five minute break, a six minute break, and we will start again at 3 p.m.
Now we have Dr. Park Hun Ho, who connected astrophysics, neuroscience, and meditation. We are now studying how meditation can uh, develop and grow more on the basis of science. And at the end of each presentation, at the end of each session, there is a Q&A. Uh, a time for Q and A. We have been collecting a question since May 11th, but you may ask questions real time. We may take case questions real time from the audience here as well as on Zoom, and it, the, the the translation service is available. Now we have Doctor uh, Park Moon Ho, uh, who is connected. Astrophysics with the meditation. Hello, everyone. I have about 15 minutes, and I will focus on physics about uh, the physical world uh, developed by the human world or figured, figured out by the humans, So, and how meditation can be viewed from the perspective of physics. The picture is about 13.8 billion years during which the universe evolved and the what happened the main event. These main events are divided into 15 stages. I present each in a diagram. There's a big bang and the time is zero at the time. Uh, these days uh, is 13.8 billion years. 13.7 uh, billion years ago, there was a big bang, and there is a quark, up quark and down quark. They uh, temporarily appear and disappear, and they they make appearance of proton, and it's a about one million second after Big Bang, in a really in, in infinitesimal time passed, and proton appeared. And at the time point, 380,000 years, in the universe, hydro hydrogen atom appeared. This is the first appearance of atom in the universe. At this time, um, over here, if you see, the arrow refers to a photon, and photon and electron collide with each other. And the electron is captured by a proton and become a, a hydrogen atom. And so with the expanding universe, the so the uh, amount of a photon, the total amount of a photon, yeah, uh, about was about thousand times, a thousand times more photon at the time of Big Bang than we have now. So, the photon I I described a photon which appeared at the time. Uh, this photon was. Uh, Measured on the by the Planck Wilson W W map probe or Kobe probe. So this is called cosmic background radiation, and we measured it. And then the first star was born. It was about five million years after Big Bang, and this day this this data is renewed every year. And soon, 
uh, the first soon it will be uh, the first start of the data could be three million years by the new uh, newly uh, uh, pro uh, new, new research based on uh, progress now. And the Earth uh, became to be evolved. In, the, in our Milky Way, uh, planets discovered is over 3,000. In 1990s, uh, about 1990, we found only one planet. About a few years ago, Kepler, uh, it was found that something like Earth, more than 2,000 stars, some planets like Earth were found a few years ago. And the, the, a planet called Earth was formed at, at, in a so at the beginning, it it had a core. It, it, its inner core was iron, and it had it it had a lot of carbon dioxide and water. So the first organism appeared. The origin of the life on the Earth is roughly estimated. Is traced by the carbon skeleton. And the credible research says uh, 3.6 billion years ago. Uh, 3.5 years ago, definitely, a carbon-centered organism appeared. The two billion, ago, two billion years ago, uh, mitochondria appeared. So, TCA is TCA cycle, uh, meaning biochemical circuits emerged. Mm. The flora, fauna, all those, everything is uh, comprised of eukaryotic cells. So, so of these nine diagrams, this, uh, these nine diagrams diagrams describe uh, 4.5 billion years. So we continue from this uh, from the previous nine diagrams and uh, the first bac bacteria appeared. It is called prokaryotic cells. Mm. So a lot of a lot of bacteria, numerous bacteria exist on the earth. And about two billion years ago, the organism had a great leap to eukaryotic cells. Um, and it it includes all kind of plants and animals, fungus. Then photosynthesis appeared. So, the if you if three of, of the three phenomena important for life for life, uh, photosynthesis is one of them. From the sun, we have a light, and we decompose uh, water into. Uh, carbon dioxide and as a byproduct we this photosynthesis as a byproduct it produces oxygen which is needed for the all organism they say mars has about 600 kind of minerals but on the earth we have 4500 kinds of minerals for example, if, if you think of magnite, the, this, kind, this rock is only found on the Earth, not on the other planets. So most of the Earth's crust 
is composed of a magnet because we have this much amount of magnite because we, we had ocean at the beginning of the Earth. Before two billion years ago, from the point of mineral, the Earth was similar with other planets. But because of the photosynthesis, uh, the Earth had a, a great condensation of oxygen. So a lot of uh, rocks were oxidized. And from this oxidation process, we had lots of numerous kinds of minerals. So after some time, we Earth's earth surface began to be transformed into soil or dust. And from this soil, the vertebrae emerged. So far, we have focused on the evolution of the biological organism, but uh, the new perspective is minerals and so if you find so co evolution of minerals and biology happened on the on the crust of earth in the first oxygen revolution, as a result, we have the uh, Earth's surface, soil surface at the beginning of the Devon period, and um, bugs, insects appeared at the time, and soon uh, plants like ferns appeared, and the Evolution was accelerated, all because of this oxygen revolution, which happened two billion years ago. Mm. So still, we have a long time to go until the age of meditation. So I will just speed up. So we have to focus on we we have to focus on oxygen. The plants do not need oxygen. But because plants uh, photosynthesis produce oxygen, uh, it is oxygen is released to the atmosphere and in the oxygen began to be accumulated in the atmosphere of the Earth about time before or after 2.5, 2.0 billion years ago. About 500 years ago, in the Cambrian period, uh, there's the, the explosion of life happened. So be, we began from the fish and about 360,000 years ago, uh, we have reptiles, part of a vertebrate, and then we have dinosaurs and mammals. So about the and dinosaurs and our forefathers, mammals, uh, they just competed with each other. And even until Jurassic period, our four, our ancestors were still reptiles. Then uh, our 
forefathers of mammals, they could not move around during the day because uh, during the day, the Earth was dominated by dinosaurs. So our forefather, our forefather reptiles, which will become mammals later, they, they were only active at night. They were about 10 centimeters long, and uh, when they went out hunting at night, their hood was usually box. So if they, if they want to find the direction, direction of their food, which are box, they had to have a keen uh, hearing sense. So they had a really keen hearing sense. And out of this development, they just uh, uh, dominated the night time. Mm. And uh, when the age of dinosaurs ended, and this changed uh, this changed the environment was uh, uh, favored by our forefathers and more than 4,000 different kinds of mammals thrived at the time and the evolution strategy of mammals was to it was the evolution of the central nervous system. So we were evolved uh, to be an animal that can be adapted to all kinds of uh, uh, ecological environment. And to be able to do that, we, we have less children. So because we have lesser children, we get to have a more effective relationship, emotional attachment to our offspring. Mm. Mm. So meditation is, meditation, we, we pursue calm and stabilize the mind and emotion. Mm. And we, why we do that? Because our emotions and our consciousness change moment by moment. Let's, let's take an example of a lion. They have a few kinds of emotions. They roar, and the weak animals have emotions to run away. But for for human beings, they had a communal life, and they had a society, and they, for their survival, it was important to read others' feelings. Yes. They had to learn, they had to perceive what others feel to be able to survive. So my focus was that how emotion had evolved for humans. For Homo sapiens, we are a lot more sensitive to emotions than other species. Why? First of all, all mammals, 4,500 mammals, 90% of them are prey. They have to run away all the time. They are seized by fear. They are, afraid, they, they are fearful of predators. The human feeling about snakes, so if you uh, go back the time, that was the instinct about, our instinctual feeling about to be to, to die or to live. We have the trace of that. It is related to survival. So the emotion of fear come to praise, and this transformed into terror. 
or fear or terror. All animals have have it, but for humans, animals don't feel fear. It's just their survival survival circuits working, and they are not seized by fear. So, animal, but humans. What makes human more difficult than fear is anxiety. Why it is more afraid? Why it is more powerful? Because most anxiety does not have any objects. So unknown anxiety, unidentified anxiety, the objects of terror, objects of fear. So fear has an has an object, so we can avoid it. We, but anxiety is not that powerful in the intensity, but anxiety dominates or seizes human human life. So we are trembling with unknown anxiety or unidentified anxiety. So for the, to this anxiety, Homo sapiens respond with meditation. Ultimately, we have to cope with unidentified anxiety. I suppose there is economic anxiety, financial problem. So I, I, I won the lottery. I have some. I have ten million one. But when this person will be okay for a while, although economic anxiety is resolved, the other anxiety uh, remain remains. So the total amount of anxiety is static. They say. So I, I can get rid of certain uh, part of anxiety. But the other anxiety increase, the whole amount of anxiety is conserved. That's what they say. Somebody argued that this is the price we paid for uh, our for our freedom. As a human, we live on this earth, and and we pay. It is kind of kind of rent we pay to the earth because we we just uh, reside on this earth. We ha we what is our habitat? This is primal anxiety and unident unidentified anxiety emerged because we have to move. Before we move, we have to predict. We have to. Anticipate and forecast. So, to have uh, uh, some kind of anticipation, to some input, some data about unknown future, unknowable future, we have anxiety. So, so human anxiety is the uh, the price we have to pay about our movement. Every moment we are just punished, punished with the the anticipation. But for the animals' perspective, they don't have a future. They don't have to anticipate. They don't have to predict. So, wildlife, they have already set paths which paths they they will traverse. For wild animals. They have, a, so if they, if they just they derail from this that path, they get anxious. Why they move around and urinate? Because they mark it is their territory. And in this familiar territory, they can adapt without the burden of anticipation. So. So for these animals, they cannot, uh, they cannot become free from environment. And for human beings, if they go beyond their familiar environment, they need some anticipation. So in our projection into life and what will come in the future, 
uh, from this activity, from this anticipation of prediction, anxiety is born. So meditation pursues peaceful mind free from anxiety. And we have to learn how mammals have emerged and evolved on this earth. We need to pursue and know that. Uh, we have time constraint. Mm? What I want to say is, <laughs> If, if I say only physics, you would wonder about what about meditation. So, yeah, uh, so mineral become soils, and soil become soil from soils evolve all kinds of animals, all kinds of life, and in this mammals, and in these primates, we can we can anticipate their effective world. So meditation, what area of the our biology we have to touch on, I'd like to expect from the physical point of view of physics. In the us, or the Earth is in the solar system. If we want to uh, depart the Earth, we need to go into the four-dimensional world and into the theory of relativity. So what this relativity wants to say is time and space are relative. They, uh, they change. You must be familiar with this. If general relativity theory of Einstein expands all over the world, and time and space change. They are a function of a speed or velocity. So ultimately, time and space change. Then what doesn't change? The speed of light. The speed of light does not change in variable, but time and space is changes uh, as, as a function of space and time. All worlds are relative. And relative means relationships. Oh, we already think existence was first. You and I were first. And in between, between you and me, there are, there are relationships. And things exist first, and then relationships evolve. But that was the world of Newton's classical physics. In this quantum mechanics uh, world, uh, all these are relative. So relative, relative theory is world of events, world of happenings. Uh, object is a static event. In the four-dimensional world, the the lump lump of events can be fixed on the one-dimensional. So uh, ultimately, there is uh, just uh, aggregate us uh, aggregates of events. So event is a uh, flashing light in a vacuum. There's a firefly, hundreds of uh, fireflies sparkling in the dark night. And on the other side, a hundred fireflies sparkling. There are in the vast vacant uh, vacuum field only fireflies. These fireflies are photons. And this uh, uh, flashy sparkle of the photon is called event. The point in between flash, one point flashy is interval is uh, measured in physics. The, the distance or interval between two events 
is the uh, gravitational field equation of the general relativity theory. So it is the, uh, if I see moon or earth, it, it is a momentary manifestation of a continuous change. And it, like a, like a, like a handful of noodles, it just flows continuously. If you just cut one point of it, this, this one point cut is the point of measurement. This is called an object. So if we minimize the error of measurement, we need to measure it momentarily. From this momentary measurement uh, uh, emerges an existence. This moment is one point on the time axis. If we pay attention to one point, uh, an object appears, but the error of time stops. So in other words, time does not exist. From the moment that does not exist, emerges existence. existence. That's why existence is an illusion and misconception. So ultimately, there is only the uh, sums of uh, lumps of events. The, the speed of light. I am just at the standing at one moment of this event, lumps of event at one point. So this is really important. When, but we look at all these phenomena in the four dimensional space time, everything moves in speed of light. Nothing is sta stationary. All things move in speed of light. Right now, we, th we think we are standing still at one point. And if you multiply time to speed of light, there's an equation. And all existence must move by speed of light. If we just stand still, we just move but vertical. So. so what I explained to you that might not feel very real or might might not feel real hmm? because we vertebrae uh, have we have evolved on the surface of Earth, and we have been ruled by the Earth's gravity. So we immediately know the concept of top, uh, above and below because of the gravity. Then one other intuition is. Uh, Front and back. All, all, all vehicles on this earth are symmetry between right and right. If the two wheels on the motor the vehicle is are not symmetry, it will not go straight. So our nervous system that have been evolved from long time ago, we can divide front and back and above and below. But, but we cannot divide, we cannot distinguish it right and left. If we try to distinguish right and left, we cannot move forward. And, and the theory of relativity is about uh, this and that or left and right. It, we, 
we have hard time understanding this relativity theory because our brain has evolved on the Earth, affected by, influenced by Earth gravity. So we have to see the whole trajectory of, uh, of on this life has evolved. Whether you perform meditation or you are on to new thinking system, we need to understand the first that based on what it has been evolved. And if I approach meditation from the perspective of biology, uh, what kind of survival strategy is it? Then we understand that we are the kind of animal always trembling with fear. And why human beings or animals are possessed with fear? So everything is just a process. Carlo Robelli, a theory physicist, they say existence is an illusion. They, he said. So existence means we existence but improbabilistically. I have a lot of things to deliver in an hour. This is me. Uh, this is mitochondria, the green uh, ones are mitochondria. Nothing is st stagnant. In every second they move. And they emerge and disappear, emerge and disappear. I'm talking about the observer moment. The moment one observes something, the existence happens. We are destined to, to see, only see the present in the present. Take a look. Our brain can produce something that does not exist. Uh, but the back, the back side is just does not have, if we turn it around, it doesn't have anything. It, it, it's indented inward, but still it, it, it looks like, it looks like, it looks like it's protruding. Our perception deceives us. Our perception does not see the nature as it is. So evolutionally, we, are, we have created all kind of illusion because it was really favored for our survival. I'll see you one more time. I'll show you one more time. The, if you see, this is the front, and this is rear, right? And if, if this is turned around, we can see the truth. It's, it's indented. But at the front, it, it looks like it's, it, it, the nose has protruded. So we, don't, we should not believe our perception. Our brain has reconstructed what we have seen. So that is perception. Brain has concocted. Mm. Most people, the external world is the fantasy, or illusion created by my, by our brain, but useful illusion. This is the all elements on the periodic table. Uh, for example, oxygen has twelve electrons, and how these electrons are distributed in time and space. This is the calculation from the quantum mechanics. And this is an, an animated representation of these electrons. Nothing is static. The, and it, this is probability. The probability an electron exists at a certain point. So 
as you can see, it changes. It always changes. Uh, on the periodic table, you have this p orbit, and so on electron, so it moves above and below and to the sides. Nothing in the universe are static. Uh, there are only probabilistic flow in the universe. The moment we measure it is uh, fixed in this moment, and that is perceived by us as an object. Oh. Can we see more from, from other perspective? This is a, a common, common diagram in the university textbook. This is the electron pr probability, the probability of electrons existence around the nucleus. This represents probability. This is reality. All these points are sparkling in probability in the axis of time and space. So, as you have seen before, these are not static. This, that is, they don't stand still. This is the periodic table, different from what you learned in the high school. Uh, the blocks are the same. In this periodic table, and this is a quantum mechanics periodic table. Take a good look at this. There is no name of elements. This is the reality of periodic table. Is you see S P D F, S block, angular quantized number. When when s when l is zero is s and two d, mm. so the the trait of elements are are determined by this way. These are alkaline matters. What you need to see are the numbers one, zero, if you transform this into wave, if you see the root, there is some units, fractions. So elements. Elements appear because the boundary of time and space is transformed into an object. So periodic table is a partition of, partition of space. If, so all their chemical properties are based on this uh, space partition. They, this L, K, M, come from their move as, so the boundary of space produced atom, then what is this boundary? This boundary or this partition is artificial. Uh, so when we say cause and effect, and when we go go down deeper into the uh, basis of it, 
it can be made differently again. The animals evolved on this planet Earth. They can divide front and back, uh, top and bottom, but they cannot distinguish left and right. That's why we cannot understand the, the world of relativity. Something we call objective reality does actually has appeared from the flesh moment. But in the end, this flesh moment does not exist. And then what exists? Only relationships exist. In the particle physics or relativity theory, uh, objects did not come first. Events, happenings were, came first, and relationships were first. And as a trace of relationship, uh, objects appeared, and the world as we see appeared. So if meditation want to secure the foundation of physics, we need to first ask the question, why the human species has evolved from the Earth? Why animals who are prey are, are always trembling with fear? And why amygdala is always seized by this fear? So complete control of this amygdala or this anxiety can just break up the existence of human being itself. So I, uh, I think we need to study rocks and soils more before we get into the more deeper. We have, we have five minutes. I'll go to conclusion. So everything is relationships. These are the these are det detailed pictures of, of a leaf. And this is water channel. Water from the root come up and all go down to the leaf, end of the leaf. If you, if you just uh, uh, exercise for uh, for a month, there there are m more more micro. You have a more development on your front prefrontal cortex. If I'm faster, the other looks the, the other looks like they are standing. They are st they are not moving. I had a I had a lunch on my train and it will disappear tomorrow morning about 10 hours the molecules of this my lunch food will circulate my body and go inside the cells and how long will they be there my liver cells will dis all be changed in two years and in two or three years, all the cells in my body t t totally changed. Everything is in my body is changed. If we see it from the four-dimensional world, this, all this movement comes in speed of light. And this world we misconceive as a uh, concrete world. See it again. This is the video of a photosynthesis. And the Braille Networks. I will introduce you a book. So what I want to say is uh, condensed all this book in this book. The understanding of standard model, that is the title by a Korean author. He, he studied particle physics all his life. Uh, 
definition of a vacuum. Uh, I go deeper into uh, definition of vacuum. The moment I define vacuum, mass was acquired. Definition of vacuum was he he wanted to say why the world appeared because you defined the soul. That's what he wants to say. He he presents many equation, and in the middle he says uh, what. Ultimately, what is vacuum? The minimum energy state. And from this, the universe uh, appeared. And the definition defined itself. Uh, def the, and the de because the defini we defined it so, the, we defined so, the universe emerged so. Uh, just uh, he said justice served a Korean reader. Thank you. Thank you so much. You did a very, very passionate passionate presentation. But we have the Q and A waiting. There are so many people. of the questions we selected. How physics can benefit meditation? Kant said sublime beauty one day Suddenly, uh, we just watch this uh, sunset on the distant horizon. And if, uh, if I, uh, I entered once on the Gobi Desert in Mongol, in, on this endless, endless desert, there's a blue sky, deep blue sky, and the sun, and the earth surface, and there's only me there. And then I realized what Kant meant by his sublime beauty. So how physics can benefit meditation as a limited species. When we meet something infinite, we just let go. We put down everything. We just let go of the perimeter of boundary of human. We need to we need to be disarmed, disarmed of our defense. We are armed with uh, armed with anticipation. We try to predict and anticipate about future. So we just watch the Milky Way at night. We are disarmed, and uh, sometimes a glimpse of true nature is seen. <laughs> then. Something at those times, I feel like uh, the little prince. Uh, we have to uh, go through the planet, planet, pl planet of physicist instead of the pl instead of a star of the little prince. We don't go to the extreme side of fa uh, fairy tale. We need to go to the, the other side, to the scientific side. We need to see the uh, stars of physicists. And when we know the physicist stars, we can eternally embrace the stars of the little prince. Second question. Eh? About mechanical meditation mechanism from the physics. Can you tell us 
what is meditation from the perspective of um, uh, physics in two or three sentences? The moment we don't need meditation anymore. This morning, I in my work, I just felt a little about that. There are some moments nothing happens. And the more we participate in those moments, uh, we can find some meaning and meditative moment. Instead of finding meaning for ourselves, we can go a little nearer to the true nature. Let go, let go of your the, the, the pursuit of meaning. So human beings are locked up inside a, a prison of meaning. So if meditation put another meaning on that, there's not a fundamental nature. I conclude. Thank you. So meditation in physics is the having insight in the in, in moment and let go of all meaning. Thank you. Uh, I'm just only, I wish we have a little more time to encompass all this. So we have only limited time. Uh, I am sorry, I ask for your understanding. Now we have the last presentation of the day. We have Dr. Lee Gang Wook from Gangwon National University School of Medicine. It's a, the meditation from psychiatric point of view is the title. Shall we start? <laughs> Let me introduce myself. I'm Lee Gang Wook. I I'm a psychiat psychiatrist uh, and a teaching the students at the university to the my main interest is meditation practice and to develop a uh, program for to use meditation to therapy and i'm especially interested in act the acceptance in therapy <laughs> the the doctor park mentioned the history of uh, <laughs> uh, some some billion years but let me r reduce it to the history of uh, homo science that we've been i mean compared to the history of earth or history of universe is quite short has we haven't been on this universe not for very long but let me still think about what humanity needs and it seems that what humanity needs is a, a finding a path to to become the true self to get to the true self and I'm very grateful that we have a, a chance like this, that we can have a, a serious and in-depth discussion about that. I would like to convey my thanks to the organizers for this chance. And they, they, I'm supposed to, to present on how the psychiatry look at meditation, but I would like to broaden the scope a little bit and see how meditation and medicine affect each other. Uh, this is the it's a, it's a, the picture from Time magazine in two, 
in 2016 is the picture of a Zen garden in a Zen temple in Japan. It seems in the West, the, the Zen Buddhism from Japan is most widely known. And it's one of their sand art garden. We usually think that the, when you think of garden, it's the trees and the ponds. But there is no water. There is no tree. But the sand garden recreate this image of water using sand. So it's a transcending the boundaries of the materials. Uh, reflecting the philosophy of the Zen, uh, Japanese Zen Buddhism. The, according to this article, now the meditation is part of the mainstream, is not some esoteric new age thing anymore, the article says. So you can see the headline. So it's no longer just your spiritual friend saying you should try meditation. It's your doctor now. Well, your doctor is telling you you should meditate. Like it, we can, I, it's worth thinking on it. We used to say to free from suffering or to be happy or to go to, to paradise or have a meaningful life. Now we have to meditate. Now, it, it has been said like that, but now it's even the doctors are saying that it's not just your pastor or the, the monks or nuns, but it's your doctor saying that if you don't want to get sick, meditate. So medicine is part of the science. And because it is a science, it, I think it has uh, more appeal to people, have more, can persuade people better. And this, uh, the, 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 the reporter has interviewed, interviewed this person and MNDFL studio and MNDFL in Manhattan. So there is no longer any religious aspect to it. So you can see the symbol this particular organization uses, and except the, the, the vaguely mandala uh, reminding shape, there is no religious aspect to it. So the, the article deals with what meditation is, from what the kind of meditation, where from, and but the modern meditation has these four pillars. It's ethically rooted, evidentially based, socially aware, and practically prepared. These are the four things all religions have. But at the same time, these are the pillars that is very universal, regardless of religion. Actually, I joined the workshop led by the Angel Kyodo Williams. Kyodo is like a Dharma teacher. She's a reverend. She is actually a certif uh, she's a Zen master. She got ten her Zen master title from uh, a Japanese a religious order. She is gay and she has a partner. She is based in New York. Well, it's, it's more like a mindfulness-based 
practice, not meditation per se. I this this is how the meditation is being portrayed in the world now, in the Western world now. Now let's look. Let's go back. Let, let me go back to the medicine and meditation. This is another article from Time. Is is another article viewed meditation from a medicinal point of view. Now the article says that it has the med meditation has to be taken more seriously from a medicinal medical point of view. And they quoted an article from JAMA, Internal Medicine. The, the article was a meta, the, the systematic review and meta, and the analysis of the, the meditation program for psychological stress and well being. I mean, from the today's point of view, it's not a very serious study. Now we have much more systematic and sophisticated study studies available, research is available. But at the time, the, the reason why this article was published by JAMA, which is one of the most prestigious medical journal, 10 years, about 10 years ago, is that uh, from a medicinal medical point of view, there has to be some really fancy uh, ca new chemical, new drug, or some new surgery, or some new device, something more flashy, something more visible. But meditation looks so benign. It, nothing to be really done. You're just kind of resting and relaxation. But does it work as well as drugs? So it's, as well work as well as surgery? Still, there are many people questioning the efficacy. But back then, it, the the doubt was far more f prevalent, and the statistical measure and the verification the hurt that is is hard to satisfy the standards but this particular article even though it it sounds very mild from a, the, the present point of view it actually satisfied those requirements and uh, published on this journal that's why it made such a splash so so I'll, I'll Standing medical effects of this of the medication was actually relatively easily demonstrated. Now, this is a article. It's a, it's a journal called Mindfulness. It has published an article about the trends and developments in mindfulness research over 55 years. The, there was the first articles, a first study about meditation in 1966. And what they did the search using the keyword mindfulness. So they didn't even use the transcendent or, or uh, the compassion. They only used mindfulness as the keyword. But you can see how much increase there was. And you can see the the, re, the the yellow is the reviewed articles, peer reviewed articles. So it, this means that there were in, a lot of individual research and study, but more and more the trend is that the the bigger trend is that there are peer reviewed. Uh, uh, the, the research, that means that there are more uh, integration and complementary uh, research done. So what is the latest trend? 
it, the latest trend is they try to be more specific about what makes meditation effective, not only meditation effective, but what makes meditation effective. I think that is uh, really necessary for meditation to be a serious medicine. And also the long-term meditation, effect of the long-term meditation is now being studied. There are two meanings about this. First is that, is it really better if you do more or not? So the those effectiveness that we are not uh, looking at it? Or is there any uh, side effects if you do it long, in the long term? So these are the areas now being explored. And the uh, MBCT and your scientific studies. And I think with the COVID pandemic, it's just another really hot issue is that uh, delivery, the using smartphone or all these uh, online delivery systems. And it's, it's, a, it's not just in meditation, but all in all areas of medicine, the digital is a very hot issue. But these are the most prolific authors in mindfulness research. The uh, Siegel is uh, the depression expert. Mark Williams is also famous. Linda Carson is an expert in mindfulness-based cancer recovery. The cancer is still the biggest medical challenge. So you can see that the, the cancer-related research takes up the chunk of medical research. So she is an expert on how the meditation can help uh, the cancer treatment. And Stephen Hayes is an uh, act expert. And Kirk Warren Brown is a pro-social behavior expert how the meditation, the Richard Davison is related. Oh, the Kirk Brown started his uh, career. Uh, he, he, he's now focusing more on the compassion. And the most cited paper, Brown, the, the well, Kirk Warren Brown, that his uh, the paper is the most frequently cited uh, the paper in the study of mindfulness is he is, uh, is the paper published in 2003 on the benefits of mindfulness but two weeks ago it has by as of two weeks ago has been cited about 20,000 times these are all really famous uh, landmark papers. So, and this I have have divided by the continent. Uh, which continent is conducting mindfulness research most? As you can see, in the past five years, you can see it's been increasing in China. So you can see that China is in yellow, Korea still green, which means China is doing more uh, mindfulness-related research than us. So it shows that China is paying much and much more attention to this area, whereas the Korea is it's not as active in terms of doing mindfulness research. And this is the, the current status, and NCCIH stands for National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. It's an organization in the U.S. It's actually a national uh, organization run by the government. Complementary health means that there are medicinally beneficial disciplines and use skills and technologies that are not quite accepted as a as a medicine however that has a good potential and these organizations exist to support these uh, budding 
uh, disciplines and technologies uh, to develop them. So, so according to this organization, the conservatively speaking, meditation is uh, effective for these these uh, symptoms. So at least in these areas, scientifically it is proven that meditation is effective. We have a national health interview as well, right? It, this is what is done in the US every five years. So, this is, um, this is uh, the survey for those activities like yoga, meditation, and chiropractic. Uh, and these are only the activities being privately paid. So you can see that in five years, from 2012 to 2017, the meditation population doing meditation, uh, paying out of their own pocket, uh, increased by three times in five years. There is increase in yoga, increase in chiropractic, but the meditation uh, exceed both yoga and chiropractic. And also, you can see the meditation for children. Also, it is paid by their uh, the parents themselves, not covered by insurance. You can see how much the parents are now teaching their children meditation. I'm I'm really looking forward to see the result for the 2000 the the, the, the National Health Interview Survey for 2020. So this, I, I believe that this meditation-based, mindfulness-based uh, the program is really uh, becoming more and more trendy. This is the, the situation in the US, and this uh, survey is part of this health interview. The Cochrane Library, You can see one of their slogan is trusted evidence. They're quite conservative and strict about the methodology. They, they are quite strict about verifying the, re, the, the latest research, scientific research. And when I did the search with the keyword meditation, there are 27 reviews. There are about 4,000 clinical trials. And these are all uh, papers and the research uh, uh, highly acclaimed, uh, past a very strict bar. Uh, this is a significant number. And if we can just uh, leap through the uh, list, the first is like basically the blood cancer, ADHD and anxiety, a terminal care, uh, including dementia. There's the asthma. So you can see a, a, a wide variety of the, the symptoms and diseases that meditation is either already being used or to be used and thoroughly researched. I think we have talked about this a lot in the morning. But let me just say that from a neurotransmitter or neurochemical point of view, the meditation is being researched a lot. So you can see all these uh, quite sophisticated scientific research in this area. All these quite complex information, well, are because they're so complicated that 
they are still at the beginning stage that the interpretation of and this the the an, an analysis of all these data has to continue and this is i think one of the most cited uh, paper in this area uh, they used the, the imaging uh, uh, so they the the, the if I summarize, this paper is saying, from a medical point of view, the meditation is effective because it helps cultivate self-regulation. The self-regulation uh, can be divided into three. It's a re emotional regulation, self-awareness, and attention control. This is how the, the meditation effectiveness and mechanism is conceptualized so far. And it shows how the doing mode transforms into being mode. And you see the, how the, it works in the brain, etc. This is another, maybe you, have, you haven't really seen this paper. That you, we have a, a medical the dictionary of the medical terms, and it, for a word to be a medical term, it has to appear in that dictionary, and to be recognized as a, a medical terminology. And the taxonomy is an essential part of it, that the, the terminology had to be defined according to the requirements for that to, uh, to be a medical term. Again, the key word is a self-regulation. And as a sub-concept of the self-regulation, all these, the mind-wandering, attention, emotions, stress, relaxation, self-reference, Self-reference is quite similar to self-awareness, can be. Uh, and the body awareness meaning intra-perception. So you are aware of your own body sensations and the connectedness to other beings. So these are eight uh, the, the subcategories of self-regulation. And self-regulation is what medical society so far uh, finds the key to the effective mechanism of meditation. So now you can see that the meditation is being broken down into these uh, uh, the terms, which will be part of the mainstream medicine soon. And you can see the mindful meditation can be divided into two. It's the loving kindness meditation, open awareness, focused attention. So this is the vision according to the object, object of your awareness. And the medicine always finds safety as its priority. So the, the, the meditation has to prove how safe it is. So there has been some criticism about the mindfulness and meditation. So there has been criticism about it. If you look at it, there are practices and programs that are poorly structured and poorly uh, delivered and practiced. And there are programs with the poor methodologies and too commercialized. And also, uh, there has been some criticism. It, ha it has been quite some time that uh, mindfulness or attention training can be dangerous to those who have trauma. And because of that, the mindfulness training must be trauma-informed. So there isn't even a book about it. So trauma, inf this is about 
the book. The book says that, that the, the author of the book is a Canadian, uh, is a meditator, a young guy. He actually had a trauma and, and went to learn meditation. And the more he meditates, the more trauma experience he had. So just looking at it, just observing it, he found out can be not very safe. So he came up with a more trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive meditation. And they are starting to compare the med effect of meditation to the effect of a drug. And when you do the the when you do research on uh, therapies or 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 drugs, they do make sure when they design the study, they define the they define the parameters of uh, for the participant subject uh, to make sure it is safe. So now these quite strict uh, the requirements are now being applied to meditation study. So you can see that it's becoming more and more detailed de uh, about the effect of meditation is now being categorized. So you can see that there are uh, 10 areas uh, in, the in the cognitive effect alone. So in the old days, the meditation has never been this uh, detailed. It's just, it's more like a master to, to disciple and it's not standardized. And medicine was like that in the old days. There is a master and there's a journeyman. Um, so it's just a person to person, but now it's being very standardized. Meditation is going through the same uh, path. Ipiku Analayo is quite well-known author that his book has been translated to Korean, several of the books, in fact. So he wrote a paper under the title, The Dangers of the Mindfulness, another myth. He concluded that the most of the dangers are coming from the, the leaders who don't really understand mindfulness and teaching meditation to others. And so is the danger is not inherent in mindfulness as uh, per se, but it comes from the poorly trained the leaders or teachers. So he's saying that the, the not only mindfulness is a technique, but it's also part of the teacher's being. So in the sense, it's a meaningful paper. So now it's been about 50 years, I believe, 40, 50 years of meditation and start being applied to medicine. So there has been lots of discussion, research, uh, research done by credible organizations and uh, competent researchers using uh, very systematic uh, scientific means. Is it still enough? That's the question. For, this is my personal opinion, this disclaimer, this is my personal uh, opinion. And uh, it's just that I want to, to well, I want this to be a stunning point to have a more discussion with every one of you. The Dr. Bok just says that, which I totally emphasize with, the the scientific methodology, especially in physics, is based upon the word, the philosophy, word view of natural science, which means that everything just happens 
on its own. There is no God. There is no agency. The only the it the all natural phenomena can be explained by the cause and condition causality. But in Buddhism or in any religion, there is what is beyond the natural world. Of course, there is the world, the relative world that is ruled by causality, but there is also the world transcended, not affected by it. And that's the goal of meditation. That's why it is developed to go beyond this, the rule of causality, causing condition, uh, causing the result. And so that's the goal of the meditation in a traditional sense. But if we apply the worldview of the natural science, which view nature almost like as a machine, so there are some conflicts. And these uh, transcendental values inherent in meditation may be too easily overlooked. This is my personal concern. And no matter how strong a human become physically, it can never be stronger than a bear or faster than a, a cheetah. Or, it, But we don't need to beat them we have because we have a technology the science of technology is now has the power to dominate nature and now the human being is trying to beat its own intelligence it has beaten nature and now dominate nature and now dominate its own intelligence. So now we're trying to make, and I, I honestly understand why human beings are so obsessed with it. Well, why are they trying to do this, to beat their own intelligence? I mean, this uh, intelligence which is inherent in human beings, it is now inherent, it is unique to human beings, but if AI has superior intelligence, why, uh, what would be the uh, justification for our own existence? And if such AI will emerge, that's a super intelligence, then what should we do to to have a happy life? We're rushing to do it, but I don't think ever, anyone is really thinking why we are doing it. I said that the, the, the cancer is the ultimate, the, uh, the peak to overcome to all, almost all doctors, and the the AI imaging technology is being used to uh, in stroke. I ask my friends who is in this field, but they are using AI because it's faster uh, detect thing stroke stroke really is a, a, a battle against time before to they have to use a really expensive machine like and they have like we we have in a really dark room eight machines and it is hard it's hard to diagnose uh, whether the person has is a high risk at high risk of stroke or not uh, that it takes a lot from doctors to decide but now if it is the 
is it you just run the data through algorithm and if the algorithm says yes the patient is in high risk of uh, having a stroke then but it's still not the AI who makes the final decision is still the doctor who's going to make the final call. We saw the, the AlphaGo. The Alpha, you see how the AlphaGo beat all the world Go champions. But the doctor machine doesn't know. And sometimes. The, the doctor, the, even experts, the, the the word foremost experts don't know why the machine is making the, such a go move or why it is diagnosing that the certain the particular patient is at high risk, but um, it's already happening. But in the future, it's going to happen more and more that the the. The human beings no longer can question and verify the machine's decision, but then. I mean, we are supposed to develop these algorithms to save human lives. But if you really look into it, people like pouring the resources, human resources, monetary resources to develop this algorithm to make money. But like, look at the Ukraine war. Uh, they have all this technology to kill thousands of those people at one go. And why do you think they may develop such technology? Because it makes money. I mean, the, the AI will soon, soon dominate medicine. And I think there is a chance that AI will take over psychiatry. Because AI doesn't get mad, doesn't get irritated. Doctors are human beings too. So doctors get irritated, get upset and angry at patients easily. So the AI may be better because they will be infinitely patient and never get mad at the patient. So you, this is a, a psychedelic drug, the psilocybin. It's, a, it's a, one of the top three medical journals in the world, the, the New England Journal of Medicine. And the, one of the most well-known the, the antidepressant is the acetalopram, and they say that psilocybin turned out to work better than this. It's, it's a sensational because it's, it's a psychedelic disease. So now there are tr uh, the trying, uh, the researching using ketamine or other uh, and marijuana. Uh, they uh, they work really strongly on the plus uh, neuroplasticity of the brain. This is from Netflix. So he's saying that time and space is to exist for me of this psilocybin. I think you hear that before, right? This is what uh, some expert meditators ex experience, this non-dual state. So I'm kind of curious. Huh? So what if oh, people use it only to experience high? So there, it's, it's very difficult to uh, where to draw the line. So would it be OK for just people who have no dep serious depression to, to, to have psilocybin just to be high? That's a good question. It's a, it's a best-selling book by Chai Meng Tang. And the book is not just about inner peace. It's about survival. It's kind of weird, isn't it? 
Now, without meditation, you can get promotion, you can make money. So basically, why you meditate? To increase productivity. This is, I think, one of the dangers of applying meditation in medicine. Why you meditate? Motivation. So this is the slide I made. The Buddha, Buddha says that we can, I mean, you can't really be free from the cycle of birth, age, sickness, and death. But meditation somehow mm, can help you to be free from suffering. And eventually, you can let go of the attachment to this birth, aging, sickness, and death. But, but medicine is kind of doing the opposite, is trying to, instead of transcend birth and death, is trying to just to live long and, and never get sick. So this is the question I had. And I found there are people who ask the same question before me. This is the book called Meditation, Buddhism, and Science. So it, the book says that meditation is being selectively applied to the Western people. And the key is it's that the, the its Buddhist origin or spiritual origin is being surgically removed and it is being tailor-made to continue the lifestyle of the westernized uh, affluent the class and this is also another book that is asking similar question and medicine at the crossroads so the, the, the one of the questions I asked to my interns is that I asked them if the <laughs> there is a, the the cancer patient the, the stomach cancer patient hospitalized which is being hospitalized is it the patient is it the stomach or is it the cancer cells a lot of students think it's the cancer cells that is being hospitalized that is being only medically addressed not the patient so this these are the ethics uh, guidelines for the Korean Medical Association. It says about human dignity, values, protection, human health. So you respect the patient, not just the, it's not just about removing the disease, but I guess we, we are making these uh, guidelines because we are not really doing it. So where should we go? I guess this is, I, I don't really have the answer. Is this something I think we must discuss together and find? This is the book I recently helped translating. I really like the book. So it's a chapter about now the healthcare needs compassion. So the, the primary care hospitals, the the cancer clinics, uh, the, ner the, the the administrators, doctors, nurses, uh, everyone involved in the health industry and healthcare needs compassion. Because hospital hospitals are where sick people come. It's, it, there is little chance of joy. People come because they're suffering, because they're they're, they are sick, they have to spend money, they're anxious about what's going to happen in the future. 
So the hospital is a space where suffering is inherent. So it's no wonder there is uh, the compassion fatigue, is, which is an active emotion. So how can we turn transform it into a positive com emotion? The answer is compassion. So unless the make unless you feel the atmosphere of the hospital with compassion is impossible to achieve the transformation. It really uh, infor, uh, enlight, enlight, uh, enlightening to me. Now there is some efforts to make compassion a uh, inherent uh, part of hospital, the healthcare. I really liked it, what they are doing. So I saw the simple human touch from my caregivers. And made the unbearable bearable. I mean, I, I witnessed it firsthand so many times. If you go to the intensive care unit, I'm sure you are you don't really know what it is that you are surrounded by this really sophisticated machine, um, and people are moving really fast yelling, screaming, emergency, people are screaming out of pain. They are, and, and they're mentally, they're all like overwhelmed by pain. That's what intensive units are like. Sometimes they're hallucinating because of the, the, the pain is so intense. And in the case, they call me. And I would say that oh, the best way is to have someone they love uh, present, give them sunlight, and and give them kindness. But that's difficult. So uh, they are given the prescription of the pain killer, killer or the sleep medicine, which makes it worse. So this, this is very simple measures like the sunlight, the simple human touch of the beloved. I think they really have to be part of, integral part of the, uh, uh, the health care. So you can see the, the, the papers are published in these areas. And the, those the the those with the red, red L arrows are the areas there are more paper paper more and more papers about meditation is are being published, which I find it encouraging. The they make this image. Uh, they, they made this uh, image by drawing how meditation is affecting other areas. So the red means that the meditation is having a great, great uh, impact. The, the, the lower it gets, the less effect. So you can see that there are more and more uh, papers using meditation to study, say, moderating role, but you can see that there is almost no paper about using meditation to get insight. This is a, from a path, uh, the, 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 the pure path. This is the stage of insight. Stages of insight. So the it's the very first step is mind and body according to this uh, ten stages of reaching the deep uh, insight and wisdom. 
So getting insight, getting wisdom is a, a step by step uh, process, but it, too much attention is given in only the first stage, which is being aware of mind and body. And this is another area that meditation study can go into. This eight see if you are filled with all these eight qualities. I think this is to stay similar to the last stage of the uh, wisdom attainment. Dukden Jinpa in the Wisdom 201 says, whatever, uh, technologies are beautiful, but technology doesn't tell us how we are supposed to use it. That's wisdom. Technology doesn't give us the wisdom. So, so the, my conclusion is that the meditation is much more than just being mindfulness. It's to attain wisdom, which is a step-by-step in-depth process. So uh, my hope is that my wish is that, I mean, it's already happening. The, the focus of the meditation was uh, predominantly on mindfulness alone, then now it's being expanded into self-compassion and compassion. And I hope that you will even expand further and be applied to medicine too. Thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you for being exactly in time. Uh, that, that now we will have about how many Q and A. So we have collected questions from May 11th, and we selected two of them. The first question is that neuroscience, when studying meditation, approaches it reductionist, re reductionistically and exper experimental. Exper Experi experientially, focusing on the functions of each brain region. In other words, your scientists collect physical and chemical data of the brain and analyze them to study the response of specific regions to stimuli and role of particular neurons. What do you think are the limitations of such approach? If, if there can be any alternative, what do you think would that be? I think that this question may be better suited to to be put to the Professor Park, the earlier presenter. I don't think there is an answer yet, but yes, this is how the meditation is being studied. You make people meditate, and you observe how brain reacts while the person is meditating. And then you collect data in different areas of brain, how each area or the region changes, or which region reacts or changes first or later. And you study how they're correlated. It's based upon this, the word view to view the nature as a machine, which means that the all the phenomena can be basically broken down in to small units. And by just putting those parts together, you can explain the whole. And the way they work with each other will be consistent. They, when they're put together, each parts will react to each other in a predictably consistent way. However, we no longer believe it. Even the same events have very different effect depending on who is the person experiencing it. Even the same person react differently to the same event, a different time of life. So now we have a different word view. So it, it it emerged in reaction to the criti criticism about this reductionism. 
and is closely related to the quantum physics. And so these, the old Newton model, which viewed the nature at like a machine, believe that the past experience form learning. And based upon this learning, you monitor the outer world and make a prediction and anticipation anticipation. And when there is a different, you pay more attention to it. That's how the brain evolved. And according to the different role given to the human beings at given time, there is a different region or different parts reacting to it. However, with that word view, is we finding it difficult to uh, to really understand the brain. So there are uh, new disciplines and new assumptions, new word view now being applied. And the same goes to apply to the study of meditation, meditation research. The Professor Park suggested that the better scientific understanding of meditation we have, the more developed meditation will be. It's true, but at the same time, often there are a, a superstars in meditation world who have an experience that ordinary human beings can hardly have. But by having these people, these superstars already approve in some way that meditation is valid. And I think it's time for science to come up with a different paradigm to approach these extraordinary cases, even though they are uh, small in the size, uh, sample size, they do exist. So I agree that we need a new scientific paradigm. The second question, I, what, what do you think is the most significant fundamental role of meditation in the future from religious and medical point of view? As I mentioned earlier, I believe that the, the hospital environment, the healthcare environment, not just the, the people, but everything, the system, the structure, has to be filled with compassion. The compassion has to be an integral part of it because It has to be the basis of the health care. So the, the effort has to be made, education, training, that, that has to, the effort has to be made to make confession an integral base of all the healthcare industry. The car, there's a book by the Karen, Karen Sweeney, Karen Sweeney, he, she had a cancer, a terminal cancer, but no one told her anything. So he, she really had no time. So she has to look at her own charts and f find that she has a cancer. So the care requires compassion as well as the courage to tell people truth. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for showing us all these very rel reliable and verifiable data. Today's presentation was themed around meditation and science. Meditation was explored in depth from the perspectives of neuroscience. Uh, 
So, meditation was explored in depth from the perspective of neuroscience, Korean traditional meditation, and physics. And this concludes the third uh, meditation expo 2022. Tomorrow, on the last day of the conference, our theme is Meditation and Future Society. Dr. Justin Bro at Brown Medical School will present Meditation and Psychotherapy. Then, Venerable Unsan and Prof. Lee Yusuf at Dongguk University will give medical space to meditation training and experience. And Prof. Che Jong Ho at Catholic Medical School will present the future of meditation, daily reality, virtual and clinical reality. And lastly, Sister. Uh, Min, Dr. Park Yong Han, and Venerable Seo Gwang will present the role of Korean meditation for the uh, industrial revolution, for fourth industrial revolution. It will present a new vision beyond the boundary of religion. So we will see you here again tomorrow with the theme Meditation in Future Society. Thank you.